and welcome to this Google Analytics full course video by Simply Learn. Today we will understand Google Analytics which is the best analytical tool provided by Google to check up on our website. We will understand how Google Analytics works, how we can use it to measure the performance of our website. We'll also understand how to set up goals and create events that will help us keep our website on track. Next. We will look at Google Tag Manager and towards the end, we will unlock the mystery of how to rank at number one position on Google. It's not that hard as you think it is. We have Rob with us who has more than 15 years of experience in digital marketing and analytics and he will take us through these topics. Over to you Rob. Welcome everyone. This is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn and today we're going to talk about Google Analytics. I'm very excited to be with you today because Google Analytics is one of my favorite Google platforms and my favorite topics. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. And we're going to start out with how to set up a Google Analytics account. And so we're going to talk about everything that entails, including creating your Google Analytics account. We're going to talk about setting up a property in your account and what a property is. We're going to talk about setting up a reporting view in your property and we're going to talk about installing the tracking code. So those are the series of steps we're going to go through today in terms of setting up a Google Analytics account. So let's get right to it. And so really the one prerequisite here when it comes to setting up a Google Analytics account is to have a Google login and ID. So when you actually go to Google Analytics, you need to be able to sign up or sign in. And so once you actually sign in, then you're gonna go walk through a series of steps. But really, that's really all you need to get the account going is a Google ID and login. So if you have a Gmail account or an other email account that you use for other Google products, then you're good to go. That's all you need to do. So when you actually go to sign up for Google Analytics, you're gonna be asked to set up a new account. And these are the series of steps you're gonna walk through or go through to set up a new Google Analytics account. So you're gonna choose an account name and then you're gonna choose a property name. Okay, so the account name can be anything you want it to be, the name of your company, your name, whatever you wanna name it. The property name is really the website name. So what website are we talking about? So here I'm gonna set up a fictitious website name for now. It's called Demo Simply Learn. So the URL for this website, Demo Simply Learn, is gonna be demo.simplylearn.com. So that's the property. When we talk about properties in analytics, we're really talking about what websites we wanna measure. And then you're gonna be asked to choose an industry category. And so for Simply Learn, we're in jobs and education. But you have a number of different industries that you could choose from. It's as important, go ahead and choose the most most relevant industry that your particular business is associated with. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about why that's important here in a minute. And then you're gonna choose your time zone, and the time zone's also important because that's when the day starts in analytics and the day ends based on that time zone. So the data that Google Analytics collects starts and ends with that time zone. So very important to choose the time zone your business is located in. Okay, and then you have some additional options here. Okay, so you have some settings. And so the first setting is to allow Google products and services. So if you opt into this, then basically what Google's going to do is share some products and services with you via email. I would go ahead and opt into that. That's of course recommended by Google. It doesn't hurt to hear from Google on related products and services that may enhance your business. The second is benchmarking. So benchmarking to me is something you should opt into. So going back to that industry and category, we chose jobs and education. So by opting into benchmarking, basically what Google's going to do is share your data that it collects on your website, in this case, demo.simplylearn.com, it's going to share that data anonymously with others in the industry. 
in this case jobs and education and because you've opted in it's going to do the same exact thing for you it's going to share anonymous data on other websites in the same industry and the benefit of that is we get to see what other websites are how other websites are performing compared to ours what's the benchmark in our industry and so the benchmarking to me is important and I'm gonna go over that in a few minutes when we go over the different reports but to me I would always opt into benchmarking because this is the only report Google provides in analytics about how others in your industry is performing versus your website okay so it's a way to compare your website performance against others in the same industry the other options here technical support and account specialist I would also recommend you opt into those because then it allows you to basically Google allow Google access to your account and they'll be able to help you if you occur or run into any issues so these are the options in setting up a Google Analytics account. It's very simple, very easy to do. You're just entering in a few fields. Note that we talking about a website right now, so I'm talking about demo.simplylearn.com, but just know that if you want to track a mobile app, Google Analytics will allow you to do that as well. You just choose the option mobile app. So we're tracking a website. We want to know how users behave when they get to my website and that's what Google Analytics is going to allow us to measure and look at we just need to do a couple more steps in the process so once we fill out these fields here we're gonna click get tracking ID now I'm going to accept the terms of service I'm going to accept another terms of service in relation to data protection I'm gonna click accept once I accept I'm gonna be able to get some tracking code the tracking ID is the ID associated with your account and so this number is going to be associated with your account so your account ID starts with UA and it's gonna be this number here now the dash one is the property you set up so in this case I set up demo.simplylearn.com if I wanted to track multiple websites under that same account then I can certainly set up multiple properties just know that every property I set up in that account is going to have a dash one dash two dash three dash four etc depending on how many properties I set up so by default I set up one property so my first property ID is dash one if I set up a second property the same account number it's just gonna have a dash two and that's important because that ID that account and property ID is going to be associated with that particular property or website so again once you finish setting up the account settings then you're going to be asked to add some tracking code to your site and that tracking code is going to be related to the account and the property so notice my tracking ID up here notice the tracking ID in the snippet of code now this snippet of code needs to go on every page of your website that you want to track and you don't have to put it on every page but if you want to track website behavior on every page of your website then it needs to go on every page of your website so if you're using a you know platform like Drupal or Joomla or even more popular platform like WordPress adding the tracking code site-wide is as easy as maybe adding a Google Analytics plugin to WordPress for example and then just simply plug in the ID now there's an alternative to adding the Google Analytics tracking code to your site and that's Google Tag Manager so Google Tag Manager is the way I would recommend going so if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager I would recommend recommend watching the YouTube video we have on Google Tag Manager you can just go to YouTube type in simply learn Google Tag Manager and this will give you a nice overview of you know, what Google Tag Manager is and how it works but basically this is the way I would go and I would recommend that in addition to having Google Analytics you set up a Google Tag Manager account and then that way you can put the tracking code in Google Tag Manager so if I go to Google Tag Manager and I just go into an account on Tag Manager I can just simply put in the Google Analytics ID right into Tag 
tag manager. And so if I have it in tag manager, then tag manager is going to be the place that holds the code and fires page view when somebody comes to my website. So that way I don't have to add the tracking code to my website if I do it in Tag Manager. So that's the recommended method for me is to add the Google Analytics ID associated with Tag Manager. If you can associate it with Tag Manager, then that's the easier route to go versus putting code on your website. Okay, so again, Take a look at the video we have on YouTube for Google Tag Manager. That's the route I would go. Now, once you do get the tracking code on your website, whether that be through Google Tag Manager or through a plugin or you know just simply adding the script to your site, to pages on your site, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start collecting data. So that's ideally the way it works. You need to add this code to your website. Now, if you're not ready to do that and you simply want to basically understand how Google Analytics works, then I would recommend getting access to Google Analytics demo account. And so if you just type in and search Google Analytics demo account, basically what you're going to do, is you're going to choose the first listing there and you're going to go to demo account. So if you have a Google Analytics or Google login, then all you need to do is click on access demo account. And so what Google's going to do is put this demo account into your account. And so it's going to look something like this. So if I click on demo account here, it's going to add to my Google Analytics account. So I'm going to have then access to the demo account from Google in Google Analytics. So I would recommend going this route here if you're not familiar, you're not sure what you're getting yourself into. So think of the demo account as kind of a test drive. You're test driving Google Analytics before you even add any code to your website. So again, all you need is a Google account. And if you have a Google account and you add the demo account to your Google Analytics account, you're gonna be able to see how Analytics works. Okay. And so that's what I would also recommend. So if you're not ready to start adding code to your website, then what you can do is just simply add the demo account. And then once you add the demo account, you're free to peruse around Google Analytics to see the different types of reports it has to offer. Now, when you do actually set up a Google Analytics account, you're going to have some settings that you're going to want to pay attention to. So when you set up the account, you have the account name and then you have a property. So under each property you have by default, you're going to have one view. And so here you can see this view here. So if we look at the account we set up, we set up a demo simply learn account property is demo simply learn. So that's associated with the website we're going to track. And then again, by default under each property, you're going to have a view. And so by default, the name of the view is going to be called all website data. And so in that view is where all your analytics data is going to be stored. So you can see my screen here. There's a lot of different settings you have. You have settings under the account, you have settings under the property, and you have settings under the view. So we're going to talk more about these settings in future webinars for advanced Google Analytics users. But for now, know that there's a bunch of settings that you have that you can play around with when it comes to Google Analytics. Anything from adding users to your Google Analytics account, your Google Analytics property or view, you can actually set up goals, you can set up filters, you can set up segments, you can link up Google ads, you can, you know, set up remarketing list. There's a lot you can do in terms of the settings as it relates to Google Analytics. But so know those settings are there. They're located right down here in this little sprocket icon. That's the admin icon. So if you need to get to these settings at any time, you could simply just click on the sprocket or the admin icon, and then you'll be prompted to choose any one of these settings here that you want to edit or alter. So now let's take a look at some Google Analytics reports. So once you've actually set up your account, you have a number of different reports that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So we're going to take a look at, you know, customized reports. We're going to look at real time audience reports, acquisition, behavior, and conversion. So these are all the different reporting buckets, if you will, that you have available to you in Google Analytics. 
So if I'm an admin and I'm looking at the Google demo account, let's start out by looking at real time. So if I click on the real time report and I just click on overview, so basically what this is going to do is show me at this point in time how many users I actually have active on the website. Okay, so that's why they call it real-time reporting because it allows you to see the behavior of users who are currently on your website. And so this is the overview report under real-time. And you can see here, I can see that 79% of my users are coming from desktop, 18%, 20% are coming from mobile, and then approximately 3% are coming from tablet. Here I can see how they actually came to the website so this is the referring source. If they came from, say, search or social, I can see the source there, and I can see what pages they're active on. And then here I can see what locations, where they're located. And so if I wanna see a breakdown of everything in the overview, I can certainly do that. If I go to locations under real time, I could see a majority of my users are coming from the United States. Okay, where are they coming from? I'll just click on traffic sources. And here I could see the different sources and mediums. Medium is the means in which the traffic was driven. So if it's Google, it's either paid search or organic search. So I could see here it's organic. Then I can actually see what content they're looking at on my website. So I could see currently I have three active users on the home page, two active users on the Google's Women's White Tea page, so forth and so on. Now most importantly if you have event tracking set up so if you have taken a look at our google tag manager webinar you know that you could set up event tracking in google analytics to measure engagement on your website whether that be a form submission or somebody clicking on the play button of a video so if i click on events i'll be able to see what events are firing so here i can see we have event tracking set up and i can see how many different events are firing on my website in real time so here i can see e-commerce somebody clicking on the quick view click some you know, a couple of users clicking on add to cart a couple of users clicking on the promotion click and as these events are fired you're going to be able to see them highlighted so if something gets fired it's going to get highlighted and i could see that these are the current events that I have currently firing on the website. And that's what's currently firing now. If I wanna look at the events that have happened in the last 30 minutes, I could just click on this link here, last 30 minutes, and it's gonna give me an overview of the events that have happened over the past 30 minutes. Okay, so that's event tracking. And then more importantly, we can also look at what conversions are happening in real time just by clicking on conversions. And so now I could see I had one active user who entered the checkout. So that's goal number four. So in analytics, you can have up to 20 goals. And so here I can see we have goal number four has already had one active user. And so if I look at the last 30 minutes, I can see I still have only one goal over the last 30 minutes, and that was somebody who entered the checkout. So that's real-time reporting. In summary, it just gives you an idea of what's currently happening on your website. And so for me, ideally, if I'm launching a campaign, or let's just say you do a new website redesign, and you wanna see how users performing and behaving, then real time's a good option for you. So you can see how things are happening in real time. Now let's jump down to audience reporting. So if I click on audience, which is just right underneath real time, I'm gonna see a number of different reports available to me under audience. And so let's click on the audience overview report. So audience reporting basically allows us to get a sense of who is coming to our website. When I say who is coming to our website, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific person. In fact, Google doesn't allow personally identifiable information in Google Analytics. Personal identifiable information such as a specific name, a social security number, credit card information, etc. However, we could still paint a nice picture on who is coming to our website, meaning what country, city, or state did they come from? What language? What device did they get to our website from? How old were they? Okay, were they male or female or other? 
What interests did they have? What browser did they use? So we can paint a nice picture based on all this information that Google Analytics is providing us under audience. So if I go to audience overview, here I can see I have all these different options available to me to get a basic understanding of who is coming to our website. So for example, I could see a majority of the people coming to our website speak English and are from the United States. Okay, in fact, that represents 61% of the users. And so Google Analytics does a great job of giving me an overall percentage. So if I have 100% of the users, I could see 61% of those users represented English speaking users from the United States. 7% represented English speaking users from Great Britain. And so when it comes to analytics, we have users and users are broken down into two categories. They're either returning or they're new. So when you add the Google Analytics tracking script to your website, what's gonna happen is if a user or when a user goes to your website, they're gonna get cookied. And if it's the first time they've been to your website, what Google Analytics is going to do is store a cookie in the browser. So when that same user comes back another day in the same browser, Analytics is going to recognize that that cookie is in the browser. And so then Analytics is going to categorize that user as a returning user. Okay, so that's how Analytics is able to differentiate new versus returning. So if that user doesn't have a cookie in the browser, then Analytics is going to recognize that, store the cookie, and then count that user as a new user. And so when you're looking in Analytics, you're going to be able to see a breakdown of new versus returning. So here I can see over three quarters of my traffic over the past week, here I can see April 6th through April 12th, three, over three quarters are new users to the website. Here I could see about 23, 24% are returning users. Okay, so I can get a good breakdown of what type of users are coming. Am I driving new traffic? Am I driving traffic that's been to my website before? What language are they speaking? Okay, I can also paint a bigger picture. How old are they? Are they, what gender are they? Do they come from mobile? So let's take a look at some of these different reports under audience. And so if I skip down now to demographics, I can click on overview. And when that report loads, I can see now under demographics overview, I can see the breakout of age ranges. And so here I can see the majority of the traffic coming to my site again over the past week. Now, if I want to change this date range, I could simply do that. I can change the date range just by clicking on the date range and then maybe going, say, the last 30 days. And I can even compare it to the previous period or the previous year. I'm going to choose the last 30 days. I'm going to click apply. Now I'm looking at data over the last 30 days. And again, you can change the date range to any range you want. You can only go back as far as when you actually created the Google Analytics account. You can't go prior to that. So here I'm looking at the last 30 days and I can see almost 47% of my users were in their age range of 25 to 34. Now, when it comes to gender, I can see 66% represent males. So I can get a breakout of gender and age as well as interest. I can click on interest and look at the overview there and see what the interest is of the users who are coming to my site based on in-market segments or affinity. I can also choose language and location. So if I wanna know exactly where my users are located when they're coming to my website, I can click on location. And here I can get a breakout 43% of the users of the last 30 days were from the United States. More importantly, I can align my audience with goals. And we'll talk about goals here in a minute, but here I can see if I have an e-commerce website, I can see of those 43%, 0.29% of those converted or purchased something. And that equates to 94 transactions. So I can get a good sense of not only how many users are coming from a specific country but are those users converting if I click on mobile and mobile to me is one of those reports I tend to spend a bit of time on because I want to know what devices users are coming to my website and so for my website here or this is the Google demo website 
I can see mobile represents approximately 27% of the traffic. So desktop still represents a majority of the traffic. So for you, you want to keep an eye on mobile because mobile is definitely a majority of what people use nowadays. That's how people start their day. That's how they transact via mobile, whether that's purchasing something, communicating, or searching. It all starts with mobile. So you want to keep an eye on mobile. And more importantly, you want to keep an eye on behavior. So Google Analytics is telling me that, yes, I have approximately 27% of my traffic of the last 30 days came from mobile. How are they interacting with my website? So if I look across this report, I'm going to be able to see different metrics. So if I'm measuring specific metrics against my dimension, in this case, the dimension is what we're measuring. And in this example, we're measuring mobile. I can see that the bounce rate is approximately 48%. And bounce rate means that if a user, in this case from mobile, landed on a page, they left the site without going any further. So they consider it a bounce. If they don't go to another page, if they leave the site from the page they landed on and they don't go any further, that's considered a bounce. So a bounce rate is the percentage of people who come to the site and leave the site without going any further. So in this case, we have 48% bounce rate. That's almost half of our users who come from mobile leave the website from the page they landed on. So is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's open to interpretation. It's definitely subjective, but you want to keep the bounce rate as low as possible. You want to keep people on your site, especially if you have an e-commerce website. You want people who come to your website to purchase. And so here we can see 48% mobile and desktop. It's a little bit lower at 41%. Now, if I look a little bit further at engagement, I can see how many pages on average do mobile users look at. So versus desktop, it's a little bit lower. You can see 3.86 on desktop, it's 4.5. Now, if I look a little bit further in engagement, I want to be able to measure how long somebody from mobile stays on the website. If they're bouncing at 48%, but they're also looking at 3.8 pages, 3.9, almost four pages per session, then that means in this report, analytics is telling me they're spending about two minutes on the site. And interestingly enough, I can see that mobile over the last 30 days had more transactions. So 51 transactions versus 34 transactions from desktop. And interestingly enough, the e-commerce conversion rate is at 0.29%. That's higher than desktop at 0.07. It's lower than tablet, but it's higher than desktop and mobile has the most transactions. And since they have the most transactions, they have the most revenue at 2,380. So yes, the engagement isn't exactly as great as it is as desktop, but we can see that people are still purchasing with their mobile devices. So it's something to keep an eye on and mobile is something I definitely look at. In fact, since it's such an important report, one thing you can do in analytics is if you actually like a report and you think you're going to look at that report multiple times, then you can simply just go ahead and click save at the top here. So if I click save, I'm going to enter a name for this report. I'm just going to call it mobile report and click OK. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be located under save reports and save reports is located under customization. Customization is located above real time. OK, so if I close that up, you can see audience real time customization. If I click on customization, if I click on save reports, I should be able to see my save report here and I do. So here I can see mobile report. If I click on it, I can simply go to the report I was looking at before I saved it. So save reports to me is a good feature in analytics because it allows you to quickly access a report that you've saved in the past. So let's take a look at one more report under audience. And let's go to benchmarking. So remember when we were setting up our analytics account, we had the option to opt into benchmarking and I recommended you do so. And so if you did actually opt into benchmarking, then you're gonna be able to see how your site 
compares to others in the same industry. So if I click on benchmarking and then click on channels, what I'm actually able to do now is compare my website with others in the same industry. So if I go back to say jobs and education, and I choose education, all education as my industry vertical, I should be able to see websites that are in the same particular industry and how I compare with those websites. So I'm choosing all countries. I can narrow that down if I wanted to. I can just search for the United States. I can choose a specific state and then I can choose a particular site size. So here I'm choosing sites by daily session. So these are sites that have an average of 5,000 to almost 10,000 sessions a day. And so in this vertical education in the United States, sites that have 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, that means that there are approximately 310 web properties contributing to this report, okay, based on this criteria I chose. Now, if my site is similar, meaning if I'm in the United States, if I'm in education, and I'm receiving 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, then I'm able to compare my site against 310 other websites. Now, Google's sharing this data anonymously from the other websites, and they're doing the same with your website to those particular websites, benchmarking reports. Okay, so it's a shared data anonymously in particular industries and verticals. And so now I'm looking at a channel report. So if I want to see how I compare to others in my industry, then I can go ahead and see by channel, for example, am I driving as much traffic as others in my industry? And you can see I'm not. In fact, I'm 76, 77% worse in terms of the amount of traffic being driven from organic search. So anything in red is going to show as a negative result, a negative comparison, whereas something in green is a positive comparison. So if I look at engagement, I can see that I might not be driving as much traffic, but I can see that the pages per session are better than the site average or the industry average. I can see if I go over again, looking just at organic search, I can see the bounce rate is better than the industry average. So the channel report under benchmarking allows you to measure how you compare to others in your industry. And you could do so by looking at location and devices. So if you opted into benchmarking when you set up your account, then you'll be able to compare your website against others in your industry, in your country, region, and based on the size of your website in terms of how many visitors or sessions you're getting per day. So let's go from audience to acquisition. So if audience is who is coming to your website, acquisition allows us to see how the traffic was driven to your website so how did these users get to our website and so under acquisition if we click on overview we'll be able to see an overview of how users whether they're returning or new came to our website and so what analytics does by default is they have a number of default channels and when we say channels we mean analytics is grouping different channels based on how users got to your website. Meaning, how did users get to our website? Did they come via organic search? Meaning, did they type something into Google and find you in the organic listing? Analytics also groups users based on whether they came to your site directly. Meaning, did they type in the URL directly into the browser? or did they bookmark your website and come back via the bookmark? So they're grouping users under direct. They also group users under referral, meaning did they come from another website? They group users by social. Did they come from a social media platform like Twitter or Facebook? If you're running paid search, Meaning if you're running paid search on say Google, then do they come from paid search ads? Now, if you're running display ads on say Google's network, Google's display network, that's a default channel. So analytics will group users there. So if they don't recognize a channel, then they're gonna group it as others. So by default, Google Analytics groups users on how they came to your website via these default channels. And so I could see 
how many users came to the site from each channel. Now, if I wanna drill down on this report, I can click on all traffic, and then if I click on all traffic, I can go to channels. I can look specifically at the channels report. And so now I can see organic search, again, over the last 30 days, is the number one channel driving traffic. And they represent approximately, again, you can see this number here in parentheses next to the raw number of users. I can see that number is about 56%. So 56% of my traffic over the last 30 days came from organic search. And so those are the number of users. Again, as a metric, you're also gonna have sessions. And you'll see sessions a lot as a metric. So users are broken down between new and returning. So every time a new or returning user comes to the website, basically what they're doing is initiating a session. So you can have a user who can come back multiple times. Every time they come back to the website, it's a session. So session is simply the start of somebody coming to your website and the session ends when they leave the website. And so just like we looked at with the audience reports when it came to mobile, we can also look at engagement by channel. So just like mobile, we looked at bounce rate, pages per session, average session duration. We can do the same thing here with our channel report. More importantly, in addition to behavior, we can see conversions. And since we're running an e-commerce platform, we could see what the conversion rate is by channel. So organic search did drive the most traffic and they did have the most transactions over the last 30 days. And the conversion rate in this case is 0.17. Okay, so how Google determines the conversion rate, they basically take the number of transactions and divide that by sessions. So that means that over the last 30 days, organic search drove 38,123 sessions. And of those 38,123, 64 actually turned into a transaction, which equates to 0.17, which also equates to 3,000 in revenue. So I'm able to determine not only how users are getting to my website, by looking at the channel report, I can actually see if they're engaging and if they are converting. And notice when you look at a report in analytics, you can look at it by channel, you'll also get a summary. So here I can see a summary or a total based on my date range. So I can see over the last 30 days, I've had 54,000 users, 49,000 of them were new. Okay, that meant that out of those 54,000 users, I had 70,000 sessions. I could see my average bounce rate was 43%. The pages per session were just over four. And the average session duration, how long did somebody stay on my website on average? About two minutes and 55 seconds. The average conversion rate was 0.14 and I had a total of 97 transactions totaling $5,500. Okay, and that's all over the last 30 days. So any report you look at in analytics is gonna have a summary. And note that any report you look at in analytics is gonna allow you to save it. So if it's a report you think you're gonna go back and look at at a future date, then you simply just have to click on the save button. Conversely, if you don't wanna save it, you can simply just export it. So you can export it as a PDF. If I click on PDF, it's going to allow me to export that as a PDF. Now you have other options available to you as well. You can do a Google Sheet, you can export it as an Excel, or you can export it as a common delimited file. So here you can see I can save it as a PDF if I want to. And if I click OK, it's going to save to my desktop or location of my choosing. And then I can go back and look at it in that format at a later time. So that's the export feature available to you in analytics. Again, if you, you could save it as well or you can export it. Okay, some other reports under acquisition. If you're running Google Ads, note that you can connect Google Ads to analytics. And this is key because now I can see how many people are coming from Google Ads to my website and are they converting? Now this is important because with Google Ads, I'm actually paying for the click. So you can see here, I'm running a report based on campaign data. So I could see what campaigns are driving traffic, how much I'm paying 
per click. And you can see on average, I'm paying 34 cents per click. And then more importantly, I wanna be able to see if they're converting. So you can see I've spent $810 over the last 30 days and received $858 in revenue. So you wanna make sure that you link up your Google Ads account to your Google Analytics account. For this very reason, you want to be able to see how your Google Ads campaigns perform once the users get to your website. And so I want to see if they're engaging and I want to see if they're converting. So there are all sorts of reports under Google Ads. So you can look at it by keywords, by search queries, by hour of the day. If you're running display campaigns, you can look at display targeting. So there's all sorts of reports under Google Ads. You just have to link it up and you link it up under the admin. Now there are other reports that you can look at. So if I go to campaigns, I can look at all campaigns. So if you're running all sorts of different types of campaigns, whether that be on Facebook, whether that be email, whether that be, you know, other types of advertising, let's just say Twitter or Instagram, you're going to be able to see those campaigns here. And that's under all campaigns. And again, you'll be able to see the campaign name and you'll be able to see metrics associated with those campaigns. And more importantly, you'll be able to see your e-commerce if you're running an e-commerce platform or if you have goals set up. So you'll be able to look at how your campaigns are not one, not only driving traffic, but two, are they converting? Let's go from acquisition reporting to behavior. So behavior reports are going to actually show you how users behaved once they got to your website, once they landed on a page on your website, how did they behave? So when we looked at audience, we got a sense of who is coming. With acquisition, we get a sense of how the traffic got to our website. Did they come from organic, direct, social, etc.? The behavior reports allow us to actually measure how that traffic behaved once they landed on a page on our website. And so if I go to overview under behavior, now I'm looking at this graph here, it's showing me how many page views I've had. And a page view is simply, once a page is viewed, it's counted as a page view. So if a user comes to my site, they're initiating a session. And if they look at a page, then that page is going to have a page view. Okay, so a user can look at a page multiple times in a session. And every time they look at that page, it's going to count as a page view. So here I can see in this graph how many page views I've had again over the last 30 days. And if I look further at my overview report, I can see the specific pages and how many page views they've had. And I can also look at some other metrics. Okay, the average bounce rate, the average time on page. I can look at the exit rate, which means how many people actually exited or the percentage of people who exited from that page. So I can dig deeper into my behavior reporting. So if I click on site content and I click on all pages, then I'm going to look at a report by page. This is my dimension. This is what I'm measuring, my page. And now I can see how many page views each page had over the last 30 days. Now note, you also have something called unique page views. So unique page views is equivalent to one per session. In other words, if a user came to my site and looked at the home page, then the home page is going to have one unique page view and one page view. Now, if the user in that same session looks at other pages, then every page that user looks at is going to have one unique page view. However, if the user goes back to, a, to the same page in the same session, then it's still going to be one unique page view. But in this case, the home page, if they look at the home page a second time, then the home page is going to have two page views. If they look at the home page five times in one session, then the home page is going to have five total page views and one unique page view. Okay, so that's why unique pages is equivalent to one per session, where pages is an accumulation of how many times the page was viewed in the same session. So in other words, you're always going to have more page views than unique pages. Okay, so this gives me a sense of how my pages performed. So again, I can look at total page views and then engagement. So ideally what you want to do with a report like this is if a user is not engaging on the page, then that should tell you something about the page itself. 
If they're not engaging, if the bounce rate's high, if the time on page is low, if the exit percentage of exit rate is high, then you probably want to do something with that page. Now, these are all pages, but if I jump down to landing pages, my landing page report is showing me how many people actually landed on that page. And so here I can see under my landing page report, I can see the home page had 36,017 sessions in the last 30 days. That's how many people landed on the home page. So here I can see 71% were new sessions, meaning that I had a lot of new users who landed on the home page. In fact, 25,000 or 52 percent of the people who landed on the home page were new i could see the bounce rates about 42 percent but of those who didn't bounce they went on to look at about 4.5 pages per session and spent about three minutes on the site and the one thing i like about the landing page report is i can also see whether that particular page in this case the home page did it help contribute to a goal or conversion and in this case, I can see of those 36,000 sessions, I had 22 transactions, totaling 1,200 in revenue, and that's an e-commerce conversion rate of 0.06%. So the home page over the last 30 days contributed to 0.06% of the revenue. So this gives you an idea of when somebody lands on your website and they land on a page, is that page helping to move that person along? Meaning, are they not bouncing? And is that page helping to move people towards converting? And so that's what the landing page in effect allows us to measure is the engagement. And in this case, we're measuring transactions. Okay, so analytics also gives us some other reports under behavior, including site speed. So site speed to me is an important report to look at, just like the mobile report. To me, site speed's important because what Google Analytics does is they take a sampling of pages. And in this case, you can see over the last 30 days, they sampled 2,835 page views. And of that sample, they came back and said, the average page load time is about four seconds. Now, ideally you wanna keep it as quick as possible. I would say even under three seconds. Okay, now there are other factors involved with page load time. The browser you're using, the country that you're actually browsing that page from might not have the best infrastructure. You may not even be on the best internet network, meaning you're on a cell network or the Wi-Fi is not that great. Or you can be on a page that just has a lot of images or a lot of code that may slow it down. So there are other factors involved. And so, what Google Analytics does is show you what those factors are. So here I can see by browser what the average load time is. If I wanna look at country, I could see what country is contributing to the load time. Now, the great thing about the site speed report is if I go to speed suggestions, okay, what speed suggestions is going to do is it's gonna show me the page load time by page and then it's actually going to provide a link where I can actually click on to get suggestions on increasing the page load time. So for example, I can look at this particular page here, this Google redesign shop by brand slash YouTube page, line number five. If I look at line number five, I can see the average load time of this page is eight seconds, almost nine seconds, okay? That's an eternity to some people. Now, notice this link next to it. So Google's recommending seven total suggestions. So if I click on seven total, what it's actually gonna do, it's gonna open up a new window and it's going to open up another Google report called PageSpeed Insights. And PageSpeed Insights is gonna give me some information about what I can do to create correct, correct the page load of that particular page. So look at the site speed report. It's important because there is a correlation between site speed or page load time and user behavior of that page. And there's also a correlation between page load time and a page ranking organically on search. So page load time is very important. It's so important that I'm even gonna save it. So I'm gonna click save and click on speed site speed suggestions as my name and 
click OK. And now that report is going to be saved under customization under save reports. Let's jump from behavior to conversions. Now, conversion reporting is arguably the most important section in, in Google Analytics because what the conversions reporting allows us to do is see how people are converting or if they're not converting on our website. And so in Google Analytics, we have the opportunity to set up goals. Now you have the opportunity to set up 20 goals in your Google Analytics view. And so to set up a goal, okay, so you're gonna click on admin and under the view, you're gonna see goals. And so if you don't even have goals, the first step is to create goals. And so you have four different goal types in analytics. So you have pages per session. So how many pages per session is so if your goal is set to say three or two, if somebody actually looked at two or three pages per session, it's going to count as a goal. Okay. So if I look here, I could see I have pages per session set at 10. So that means that if a user came to the site, looked at more than 10 pages per session, then it's going to count as a goal. Another goal type is destination. So destination means that if somebody actually went to a specific page, then it's going to count as a goal. And in this case, I can see here that the goal is set to this particular page here. And so when somebody actually lands on that page, it's going to count as a goal. Now there are two other goal types we can look at. One is duration. So just like pages per session, in our previous example, if somebody looked at 10 pages per session, it's going to count as a goal. With duration, it's based on time. So in this particular case, if you set up a duration goal and the duration is set to say one minute and 30 seconds, then that means if a user comes to my website and they spend at least one minute and 30 seconds, then it's going to count as a goal. Okay, and then the fourth type of goal in Google Analytics is an event-based goal. So when you set up event tracking, you could turn that event into a goal. So if somebody clicks on, say, the submit button of a form, you can turn that event into a goal. So here you could see the category equals contact form. So you can always verify if a goal works just by clicking on verify this goal. And in this case, this event is turned into a goal. So anytime somebody fires this event, it's going to count as a goal. So you have four different goal types in Google Analytics. You have pages per session, destination, event, and duration. And so once you've set up a goal, then you can measure goals under conversions. So now if I look at goals overview, I can be able to see how many total goal completions I've had. So if I want to look at it by goal, I can just choose the goal option here. So if I want to look at, for example, goal two, engaged users, this was the pages per session, I can see that I had a conversion rate of 10%, meaning that I had 7,000 of all the users who came to the website, 7,000 goal completions, meaning 7,106 users looked at 10 pages or more on my website. And so that's how you want to be able to measure whether users, where they're ever they're coming from, whoever they are, whatever pages they look at, you want to be able to look at the conversion reports to see if they're actually converting based on the goals you've set up, whether that's pages per session, duration, destination, or event, goal conversion tracking reports can help you measure who is actually converting. And then the great thing about Google Analytics here is that I can actually see by segment. So the default segment and a segment is just looking at a specific user set. So the default segment is always all users. However, I can choose a different segment. So if I wanna choose instead of all users, if I wanna choose mobile traffic, I can select mobile traffic, hit apply. So I'm actually now looking at a subset of data. I'm looking at mobile traffic. So of all the mobile users who've come to my site, I can see 1,400 engaged or looked at 10 pages or more. Okay, And that's a 7% conversion rate. So the great thing about Google Analytics is you have the opportunity to set up four different goal types. Okay, based on those goal types, you can go to goals overview and look at the conversion rate of each goal. 
but you can also change the segment of that particular goal to see who exactly converted. Okay, another report I like under conversions is the multi-channel funnel report. So if I click on multi-channel funnel, basically what this allows me to do is see how different channels work together to convert. So remember the channel reporting we looked at under acquisition? Here I can see now how different channels work together to drive the conversion. So if I look at three channels, direct, organic, and referral, I can see all three together drive 2% of the conversions. If I look at direct and referral, 12.5%. If I look at direct and organic, 12.24%. So I can see how different channels work together. And so if I look at top conversion paths as an example, I can actually see what channels, how channels work together to drive the conversion. So in this example, I can see over the last 30 days that my top channel grouping was direct times two, meaning that somebody came to the website directly, meaning they typed in the URL in the browser or they bookmarked it and came to the site. Okay, they came the first time but didn't convert. But then they came back a second time via direct and then converted. So that combination is my top conversion combination of the last 30 days. My second best conversion grouping is organic search and direct, meaning that a user came to the website via organic search first, did not convert, and then came back via direct the second time and converted. So basically what analytics does is give credit to the last referral, meaning if you came to the website via referral, a referring website and converted, then the referring website's gonna get the credit for the conversion. But analytics does a good job of showing you how different channels work together. So a channel may drive a lot of traffic like organic search, but that traffic may not convert the first time around for a number of different reasons, whether it could be brand recognition, price shopping, reading content, whatever the case, analytics is able to measure if that channel actually did contribute at a later point. And in this case, we could see organic search drove traffic that didn't convert, but that traffic came back a second time via direct and did convert. So that's our second best channel grouping. And so the multi-channel funneling report, top conversion pass, to me is a good report to look at. So you can actually see not only how channels work together, but you can see sources and mediums and campaigns and how all that, all those different campaigns and different sources work together to convert. So that's just a good report to look at. There are so many different reports available in analytics. There's so many that we haven't even gotten to yet. So my advice, if you look at the demo report, you can get a feel for each of these reports under each section, whether that be audience, acquisition, behavior, or conversions. Take a look at these reports, see what makes sense to you, see what you can use to improve your website performance. For this particular webinar, we're gonna jump into Google Analytics directly and spend all of our time there because it's about learning practical applications. So goals are important. Goals, uh, let me just say this, goals are in analytics, something that should be aligned with your business. And we call goals that are aligned with your business, KPIs or key performance indicators. So it's very important as a precursor that you know how to set up goals in Google Analytics, because if you're using Google Analytics, you wanna measure everything against a goal. So without further ado, let's jump right into Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics and I log in, okay, what I want to do is go down to admin, click on admin here, and admin will take you to basically a screen that looks like this, where you have an account column, you have your property column, and then you have your view column. Now, the view column is where you're gonna go to set up goals, okay? So every view in every property has up to 20 goals, okay? So by default in analytics, you're gonna have at least one view for your property. So if I have a property, I'm gonna have at least one view. But if I happen to set up multiple views like you see here, then I know for every view I set up, 
I have 20 goals to work with. So where are those goals? So under the view, I'm going to click on goals. And now I can see I have 20 at my disposal. Now you can see here by clicking on the recording column, I can see I have in this particular property, this particular view, I have five goals that are active. So you can use up to 20, but you don't have to have 20 active. Okay. You can have one active, two active. My recommendation is at least have one goal. Again, when you set up a goal, you're going to measure everything in analytics against that goal. Okay. So in this case, we have five particular goals we're measuring. So we have five active out of 20 total. So if I don't no, no longer want to use a goal, I can simply just turn it off. If I want to continue using it, just turn it on. Okay, it's that simple. You could turn on and off goals. So here I already have five set up. So if you want to set up a new goal, the one thing you need to know in Google Analytics is in order to set up a new goal, okay, you need to have edit access at least the view level, I would say at the property level. So you want to make sure whoever's in charge of Google Analytics for your organization, or if you're in charge, okay, you simply just want to go to user management and user management. You want to make sure the email address you're using to log into Google Analytics has at least edit permissions. So you're going to need edit permissions to add new goals. So I have edit permissions. I'm going to go to goals and I want to set up a new goal. But before we jump in and set up a new goal, what is it that we want to achieve? That's really the question we want to ask ourselves. What is the goal of the website? Well, if it's somebody downloading something, okay, are you measuring that download via an event? Okay, are they filling out a form submission before they download? So if they submit that form submission, is that the goal? Or do you have an e-commerce site? Is somebody purchasing something? So these are things you want to ask yourself before you actually set up the goal. What is it that I'm trying to measure? Now, when you actually do go to set up a goal, you're going to click on the red CTA button that says new goal. So analytics actually has some templates set up for you. Okay. You can see them here. Okay, if you're somebody's registering online or creating an account or reading review, downloading something, sharing something, you could choose all of these options here. What I normally do is choose custom. 99% of the time, I'm just going to choose custom. It doesn't really matter if you use the template or not. It's just a template is basically some free pre-filled configurations. But my recommendation is always just go with custom. You want total control over how to set up your goal. So we already have in mind what type of goal we want to set up. So for example, if somebody goes to fill out a form submission and they go to a thank you page after that, well, what's the URL of that thank you page? We want to be able to track how many people go to that page because we know if somebody does type in or fill in a form submission and goes to that page, we know that they filled out the form. And so for example, if I go to continue, I'm going to name my goal first. So I'm going to say thank you page. As an example, notice analytics is assigning an ID. So notice this is goal ID 15. That means that that's the next available goal. There are 20 goals available in analytics. And so what analytics does is they group goals together. So 1 through 5, 6 through 10, 11 through 15, 16 through 20 into goal sets. So for example, goal 16 through 20 is part of goal set 4. And why does Google Analytics combine these goals into different goal sets? Well, because it's easier to ma measure and look at data by goal sets. So for example, if I jump into any report here, if I go to all traffic channels and I want to measure how many goals by channel, I can look at it by goal set. So if I have goal set one selected, then I know any goal I have active in there between goal ID one through goal ID five, I'm going to be able to see those goals in goal set one. And now I'm going to be able to measure every goal I have active in goal set one against the channel. So if I choose goal set two, whatever goals are active there, goal set three, etc. 
Notice I don't have any goals 16 through 20 active that are in goal set four. Therefore, I don't have that option available to me. So back to admin, the bottom left navigation, again, goals. Okay, we want to measure somebody going to the thank you page. We have edit access. We're going to choose custom as our goal setup. We're going to type in a goal name. I'm just going to say thank you. Okay, this is goal 15. Now, this is the important part. Google Analytics has four different goal types, destination, duration, pages per session, or screens per session. So screens per session is related to mobile because Google Analytics measures mobile app activity. And then you have an event. So we're gonna cover all four of these, but for the sake of this simple example, I'm gonna choose destination. Why? Because if somebody goes to that thank you page, we're going to go ahead and put in the thank you page as the goal, the goal URL. So for example, destination is my choice. I'm going to click continue. Now this is where I'm going to put the URL. So if my URL is just simply thank you.html, I can just go ahead and put thank you.html. Or if it's just thank you, then I can just do thank you. Depends on the website, depends on the URI structure. So whatever that URL is, that's what you're going to put in. And when you're done, you can verify it. So what Google Analytics does is actually will verify over the last seven days if anybody's actually gone to that particular page. So if we click verify, we could see 0% conversion rate. So that tells us that if this is the correct URL, then we've had 0% people go to that page. This is just an example. However, if you didn't see a conversion, then you might want to make sure you check the URL here that you put in. And if you do see a conversion rate, then you know it's working. So Google Analytics actually has options. So we're saying thank you is equal to. So the destination URL is equal to thank you or thank you.html or thank you.asp or whatever that thank you page is. Okay, you do have options. So if you have a long URL, you could say begins with, and you could say begins with say thank you. So this is the logic. We're gonna say, hey, if anybody goes to a URL that begins with thank you, then count it as a goal. Or you could say equals to. So if anybody goes to a URL that equals to thank you, then count it as a goal. You have one more option here, regular expression. So Google Analytics understands the language of regular expressions. So regular expressions are just special characters used to communicate with Google Analytics in order to hone in on exactly what you're trying to track. So we can always say, you know, starts with or ends with. So we can, you know, use characters like the dollar sign ends with or begins with. So we can always do that. So you can use regular expressions as well if you're familiar with regular expressions. If you're not, then you don't have to use them, but there are special characters where that you can insert in that are used as regular expression. So if you're not familiar with regular expression, don't choose that option. You could choose the other option of equals to or begins with. Now note that on all three of these options, I didn't put the domain. So if my domain is ama-foundation.org slash and then thank you, I don't need to put the domain because analytics is already, already knows what domain we're tracking. So you don't have to put in the domain here when you're entering in, in this case, the goal URL. So you can omit the domain. So when you put in that URL, you know that you have three options to work with and then you always, always want to verify that goal URL. You always want to verify it because if you see 0% conversion, and in this case over the last seven days, then that should tell you something. Either your goal is not set up correctly or you just don't have any conversion. Either way, you want to double check that. Now, when it comes to the destination URL goal, you do have an option here for funnel. So if I turn on funnel, then that means I have the ability to track how people went through my funnel. So if I have a cart and I want to be able to check how many people go in and out of the cart, then I have the option of adding specific pages as part of the cart. So we could say, you know, step one, 
which is basically cart. We could say step two is billing information. That could be slash billing. We could say step three is shipping information slash shipping. And then step four could be, you know, confirm. And that could be slash confirmation. So whatever your URL structure is for your cart, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a cart. Basically, all I'm doing is putting in a series of steps with URLs as each step. And why do I want to do that? Because I can then track how many people go through my funnel that I've created. Okay, so here I could see this is my funnel that I've created for this particular goal. Okay, and the funnel is only available for the destination URL. So the funnel is available if you want to see traffic through the goal. Okay, and how it, people go through the funnel and where they drop off. Now you have an option here to make the first step required. So if you make that first step required, then that means you're measuring the funnel through the first step only. Now, if I turn that off, then I'm measuring the funnel through each step, meaning that I can measure people as they drop in and out of the funnel. Where if it's required the first step, then I'm only measuring traffic as it enters in the top of the funnel. So you have that option available to you, the funnel. And then for all goals, you do have a value. So if somebody did actually convert, okay, Google Analytics is going to count it as a conversion and you can assign a value. So if you're not an e-commerce website, then you may want to think about assigning value. If you are an e-commerce website, then analytics has the ability to track e-commerce revenue for your website. So you don't need to add a value. But in this case, let's just say you're a nonprofit organization and you're collecting donations. And on average, over the past year, every donation that somebody contributed was equal to $5. Well, you can just go ahead and put $5 in there as the value for that goal. So that means that if somebody did go to, in this example, slash thank you and convert, Analytics is going to count it as a goal and then assign $5 value alongside that goal. So if you're non e-commerce, if you're say a nonprofit like this organization or you're B2B and you want to track some value, then you have that option there. So with the destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. With all goal types, you have the option of adding a value. All goal types, and we're going to go through the rest of them, you have the option of verifying that goal. So that's the structure of setting up a goal. Destination URL is just one goal type. We're going to talk about the other three goal types because in Google Analytics, there are four goal types. Again, destination is one of them. With destination, as you do have the option with all goal types, is you have to be able to choose your logic here. So we're going to cover that with the other three, but just know when you set up a destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. Now, when you actually do set up a funnel, What's going to happen is analytics is going to measure traffic as it goes through the funnel. So where do you look for that funnel information? Well, you want to get out of admin. You want to go to the left side navigation. You want to click on conversions, then goals, then funnel visualization. So based on the funnel you set up, you're going to be able to see traffic as it goes through the funnel. So notice on this particular funnel, we don't have the first step required. Why? Because I could see traffic as it goes in and out of each step of the funnel. So let's go through this funnel and see how people react. So here I could see the first step is the store front page. So over this particular period of time, I had 84 sessions enter the store front page. So out of those 84, I can see 21 left the store front page. 63 went on to the next step in the funnel, which is the cart page. I can then see 24 people went on to the cart page directly and five exited the site altogether. Okay, so that gave me 87 total. And from 87, I saw that 82 went on to the next page with the next step. What analytics does is they give you a percentage. So in the first step, we had 63 move on to the cart page. Out of 84, that's 75%. So from the cart page to the create your account page, 
we had 94% move on. So we didn't have anybody enter in the create your account page. We didn't have anybody leave the create your account page. So we have 82%, 82, create your account, and then we have 82, move on to the payment page. So that's 100%. Okay, we have one exit, so we have 81 that proceeded to be on the payment page, which was purchase. So 81 of 82 is 98%. And we started with 84, so that gave us, plus the 24 that we accumulated along the way, so that gave us a 75% funnel conversion rate. So 75% of the people who entered in the funnel went on to purchase okay so don't be confused with the overall e-commerce conversion rate so 75 percent is the funnel conversion rate the overall conversion rate for this particular goal is 18.45 percent over this particular period of time why because that takes into account all sessions that have won to the website so 18 percent of all traffic went on to convert but those that did go into the funnel 75% converted. So that's a look at the funnel. So if you set up a funnel, that's what it's going to look like. You have the option to measure everything from step one and beyond or measure as traffic goes in and out of the funnel. So the purpose of this is we're going to be able to see where traffic drops off, how effective our funnel is, what pages we need to address in that funnel. Okay, so that's the whole point of the funnel, and the funnel is available with the destination URL goal. So if I go back to admin, if I go back to goals under the view, I can actually see what that funnel looks like. So here we chose regular expression. So this is what the URL is. Okay, you can see our funnel in each of the steps we have set up. Notice we're using regular expressions here, and then if we verify this goal, we could see over the past seven days, 19% conversion rate. So that tells me something's working in this particular, with this particular goal, because we do have a conversion rate. Okay. So that's the destination URL goals. Let's now talk about the other three types of goals. So the next goal type we're going to talk about is pages per session. So if you're not sure what type of goal to set up, for your website. At the very least, you should try and set up either duration related goal or pages per session related goal. So let's talk about the pages per session. So basically what this goal is going to allow us to measure is, for example, if we set the goal to three pages per session, then we're going to be able to measure if how many people went to the site and looked at three pages per session. So let's take a look at that goal. So if I open up the goal here, I can see three pages per session is what we're naming it. So basically what we're asking analytics to do is anything greater than two pages, which would be three and beyond count as a goal. So if anybody comes to the site, looks at more than two pages, three pages or more, then it's going to count as a goal. And so here we can verify it. So if we verify it over the last seven days, we could see a 4.12% conversion rate. And that tells me that 4% of my traffic over the last seven days looked at at least three pages or more. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what number should I put in for the actual variable? So in this case, we see two. Well, what you want to do is you want to look at on average, let's just say year to day, you want to make sure you have statistical significance. So you want to look at a period of time. So if you go to analytics, go to audience, okay, and then if you go to overview, and if I change my date range to year to date, I could see on average right now, I have 1.21 pages per session. So that's on average. So we don't want to make our goal one page. We don't want to make our goal two pages. We want to make it three. So we want to be able to basically measure at a higher rate. Okay. Why do we want to measure at a higher rate? Because if 1.21 is the average, then two pages per session really isn't moving the needle. So what we really want to do is get people to stay on the site longer, look at pages more 
uh, during their session. So look at more pages. And so we want to be able to see what segment of the audience is looking at more pages, what channels driving traffic that's looking at more pages, what pages are contributing to more pages per session. So the whole idea is you want to hone in on what your goal is and see what's working and then see what's not working so you can make adjustments. The whole idea behind Google Analytics is to improve website performance. And so if our average is 1.2, then if we change it to just two, it may not be good enough. So in this case, you know, we want to up the bar a little bit. So we're going to choose three. Now you can choose four or five. That's perfectly fine. Just know if your average is 1.2, I wouldn't choose one page per session as my goal. And I probably wouldn't choose two. So I'd set the bar a little bit higher. Now, the third goal type available in Google Analytics is also engagement related, and that's duration. So just like pages per session, we can measure how long somebody stays on the website and we could set up a goal for that. So in this case, I have a goal set for one minute, 30 seconds. So my goal type is duration. So if I click continue, then basically I'm asking analytics in this case, Anybody who stays more than one minute and 30 seconds on the website count it as a goal. And so before you actually put in the number of hours, minutes and seconds, you want to look at that average. So if you go back to audience overview here, I can see a minute and seven. So do we want a minute and 30? Maybe we could do that. Maybe we can go with two minutes. So again, the whole point is you want to set the bar a little bit higher than what the average is. And so here I can see over the last seven days, if I verify this particular goal, I can see 8% of my traffic over the last seven days stayed on the site at least one minute and 31 seconds. Okay, they stayed greater than one minute and 30. And so the whole point is you can hone in because this is a goal. I can go in, this is goal, okay, this is a goal here. And so I could see that this is goal 13. So now I can go to acquisition as an example. I can go to channels as an example. Since this is a goal, this is goal 13. So that would be in goal set three. So I can actually see what channel is basically driving that goal. Okay. In other words, what channel is driving traffic that is staying on the site at least one minute and 30 seconds. And so that's the whole idea behind goals. So likewise for pages per session, we can go into channels and here I can see we've have a th over this period of time, year to date pages per session, we have 3% conversion rate. And here I could see, for example, organic search has a 13% conversion rate here. I could see social media has a 10%. So I could see that or people coming from organic search are staying on the site longer or they're looking at more pages than any other channel. So just like duration or destination or any goal you set up, you can measure that goal against any dimension just because it's engagement doesn't mean you can't, you absolutely can. And so the whole point of engagement related goals is to figure out, what's driving traffic to the site, but what traffic is engaging. So you want to be able to pinpoint that so you can improve website performance. Now the fourth goal type available in Google analytics is an event. So if you click on new goal, you close custom, click continue, you have the option to choose an event. So an event is something that you can measure on your website that analytics can't measure by default. So if you want to measure PDF downloads or clicks on buttons or clicks on play buttons on a video or click on a submit button or click on an external link, I mean, you can measure pretty much anything with an event, then you want to be able to turn that event into a goal. So let's quickly summarize what an event is. So again, we want to be able to measure a particular event that happens on the website. So in order to do so, we need to identify that event. So if I go to, for example, this particular website here, and I want to measure how many times somebody clicks on the donate now button. 
Well, if I met, I can measure that as an event. So when you set up an event in analytics, you have to actually assign a category and an action for that event. So that's the first thing you need to do when you identify an event related goal. First, you need to set up the event. And in order to set up the event, you need to assign a category and action. Okay, so once you identify what you want to track as an event on your website, you're actually going to go in a tag manager or have your webmaster go in a tag manager and set up a tag. And in that tag, they're going to assign that particular category and action. And so here you can see we have this set up. Our category is named donate now and our action is click. And that's what we want to do. We want to measure how many people click on that donate now button. So anytime somebody does that, then the category donate now is going to appear in analytics with the action click. So when you actually do set up an event, you can go into analytics and you could test that event. So if I go to the website and I click donate now, okay, the reason why I have this as an event is because I'm taking to a third party website to handle the donations. So here I can go into analytics and now I can see a category is being fired for header donate with the action click. So that's my category and that's my action. So that category and action is what is firing after somebody clicks on the donate now button. So if I want to turn this event into a goal, I can easily do that. Now that I've set up the event, now that I've identified the category in action, I want to go back to admin and set up the event with these parameters in place. So it just turns out we already have the goal set up. So let's go through how this goal was set up. So first we chose custom, we chose event, we gave it a name. So as a best practice, when you actually set up a goal as an event, or turn an event into a goal, I would add the prefix event colon to it. And then that way, when you're identifying goals and you're reporting, you know it's an event. So I'm gonna click continue. And now that I've actually have set up the event already in Google Tag Manager, I've given it a category, I've given it an action. Okay, see so here you can see we have a regular expression set up. So anything with the header donate or donate is going to fire this goal. So over the last seven days, I have a 0.81% conversion rate. Okay, I could have easily put in equals to and put in whatever the action what or the category which is donate now or i could have put action equals click i could have done that as well so let me show you another example here so if i do this custom continue events donate now here's my goal id it's going to be an event so all i need to do is put in the category and action so donate now and then click so that's all I have to do, and that's my goal. So I can verify it, okay, to see if anybody's fired it. And basically, that's what I need to do to turn that event into a goal, okay? So you need to set up for an event. First, you need to identify the event, set it up in Google Tag Manager, which is another platform. And once you've done that, then you have your category in action. Once you have your category in action, you're again going to go into analytics and then simply put in that category and action into the appropriate fields to set up your event related goal. Now, all events don't have to be turned into a goal. If you actually do set up an event and you're not worthy of a goal, meaning it's not a KPI or doesn't align with your business goals, well, don't fret, you can always just go to behavior, okay? You can always go to events. You can always go to overview and measure your events that way. So here you can see all of our events that are fired. Now we do have this one turn into a goal. So if it's important for our business, then we wanna make sure we convert that particular event into a goal. Okay, if it's not important, for example, somebody's just clicking on a social button, then you don't necessarily have to turn that event into a goal if you don't want to. Know that it's sitting here under events, under behavior. So the point I'm trying to make here, if it's important to your business, 
and you're already tracking it as an event via Google Tag Manager, then feel free to turn it into a goal. All you need is that category. All you need is that action. And so, so one final note on that event related goal, just like any other goal, you can add a value. Okay. So if I have an event set up, I can choose to add a value here or in Google Tag Manager, if I've assigned a value to that event, so if I go back to the actual event in Google Tag Manager, you could see I have a value set up for $1. Then I could just go into analytics and say, you know what? I already have the value added. So go ahead and use the value added in Google Tag Manager. Okay, so I'm gonna choose yes. Now if I choose no, I have the option to add the value here, just like I would with any other goal. So just keep that in mind. You can add a value to any goal type with an event related goal. You can add the value right into the tag in Google Tag Manager, just as I've done here. So remember when you actually set up your goals, whether it's a destination, pages per session, duration, or an event, you can just go ahead and choose that goal set that it's in and measure any dimension against that particular goal. So here I can see e-newsletter signups by channel. I can go into another goal set here. I can see contact form submissions. Okay. I can see what particular channels driving contact form submissions. Okay. So just know that you can align a goal against any dimension. So if you have e-commerce, you don't have to set up for goal for that. That's separate. But if you want to take a look at your goals, and analytics on its own, you can just go to conversions, goals, overview. Here, I can actually get a good sense of how my goals are performing over a period of time. So again, if I choose, for example, year to date, now I could see based on the goals I've set up, how many total goal completions, value, which takes into account the value we've added into these goals, Okay, the total conversion rate. And here I can see it broken down by the goal I actually have set up. And I can see it by page or I can see it by source of medium. So I could see Google Organic is driving the most goal completions, then Google CPC direct, and then I could see some others in here as well contributing to goals. Now, I do wanna point your attention to another report in Google Analytics that does take into account goals and that's multi-channel funneling. So again, under conversion goals, multi-channel funnels, if I go to assisted conversions, I can actually see what channel in this example is assisting with the conversions I've set up. And so what do we mean by assisted conversions? Well, that means that if a channel, let's just say organic search drove traffic to the website and that traffic didn't convert when it arrived at the website and left. But it came back a week later via another channel, let's just say email. And when they came back via email, they did convert during that session. Well, what analytics does is they give an assist to organic search because they help drive the traffic to the website. So it's similar to the game of basketball. If I have the ball and I pass it to my colleague and my colleagues, the one who scores because they had the ball last, well, they get the credit for the point, i.e. the conversion, but I get an assist. And so analytics works the same way. They're always going to give credit to the last click or direct conversion, but they will give credits to the channel in this case that assisted with the conversion. So that's under assisted conversion and that's based on the goals you have set up. You can highlight any particular goal here. If I want to hone in on say the donate clicks only, then I'm going to be able to see what contributed to that particular goal. So there's another report in here, top conversion pass that I think is important. So after you set up your goals, you can actually see what channels in this particular example help to drive conversions. Again, this is year to date. So I can see all the different combinations of channels that work together to contribute to a conversion. So again, I can choose a specific goal or I can choose all my goals. So 
Those two reports are under multi-channel funneling. There's also another report that I think is good, and that's time lag, meaning how long did it actually take somebody to convert? So here you can see most of our conversions, 265 year to date, happen on the day somebody arrived on the website. But I could see I did get some conversions a day later, two days later, etc. So you have time lag, top conversion paths, assisted conversions. They're all under multi-channel funneling and they're all available after you set up at least one goal. And so if you're not sure what goal to set up, okay, don't fret. You can always at least set up an engagement related goal. So that's available to you. Duration, pages per session. You also have destination and event tracking. And they're all available to you. You have 20 available per view. Now, if you're not quite sure exactly what type of goal to set up, there is an option available in analytics and that's the gallery. So you can always import a goal from the gallery. So in other words, we could take a look at what other people have set up in terms of goals. So you just have to click on the button import from gallery and I'll take you to the gallery and you'll be able to see what other goals others have set up. Today we're going to talk about how to set up event tracking in Google Analytics. So let's get started. So many of you out there have a website similar to the one I'm looking at now. This is a nonprofit that I work with, Ama Foundation, and like this website and probably like your website, you probably have some interactivity on there that needs to be tracked. For example, buttons. Uh, if you have buttons like this one that says donate or newsletter sign up or there's a PDF download or a video that needs to be, you know, tracked based on the amount of people who click on the play button. So, I mean, all sorts of interactivity on a website. Have you ever wondered how to track that? Well, there is a way to track that because by default, Google Analytics can't track interactivity and engagement on your website like you probably want to have your website tracked. So if you have buttons and videos and things of that nature that you want to have tracked, well, you're going to need event tracking. And if you're in analytics and you're always wandering around the data and you happen to find yourself under events, well, if you want events on your website and you want data to populate under behavior top events, you're going to need to set up event tracking. So event tracking is a two part process. And we're going to talk about that two part process. The first part of that is to identify what you want to track. Okay, so if we go back to our example website here, I'm a foundation. Again, we noted there's a lot to track here. We got a donate now button, we got a newsletter sign up, we have some social icons. Okay, we got a donate now button here, we got a play button here, we got all sorts of interactivity. You know, we got a button here that says, you know, purchase tickets for an upcoming event. I can go throughout the website and find different buttons and things to, to, to track. Let me just say this, there's no shortage of what you can track on your website with event tracking. So event tracking is just basically in layman's terms, tracking engagement on your site. Because Google Analytics by default is only gonna track page view data, meaning how somebody got to your website, what page they looked at, how long they stayed on that page, what page they left from. More or less their timing, how long somebody stays on the website and what pages they look at. So there's more to a website than just how long somebody stayed on a page. And so in this example, we want to be able to track everything here, not just the donate now button, but everything, because once you get the hang of event tracking, then it's very easy to set up. Okay. So step one, identify what you want to track. Okay. So there's a lot we want to track. We're just going to use one example to start off with. And that's going to be this donate now button. Okay. So this donate now button we want to track. Now we have a newsletter sign up. We have Facebook and, and that's fine. You could track all that, but for the sake of going through a step-by-step -step process today, let's just focus on the donate now button. Let's focus on the donate now button. Then we'll come back and start tracking these other things. But this is what we want to track to start out with. Okay. So step one, identify what you want to track. Now, when it comes to tracking events on a website, you want to identify those events. So we did that by choosing this donate now button. Now, once we identify what we want to track, we need to assign 
two parameters for that event. So with event tracking, you have three parameters, but one is actually optional. So you have two mand mandatory parameters that you have to assign to everything you want to track on your website. And that's the category and then the action. So event label or label is the third parameter. But again, that's optional. Okay, so basically, when we identify an event on our website, we want to assign it a category and an action. Okay, so why do we want to assign it a category and an action? Because when we are in analytics, under behavior, under events, top events, we could see we have different categories here and we have different actions, we have different labels. So if I click on any one of these dimensions, I'm gonna be able to see some of the parameters I've entered in for previous events I'm tracking, okay? So the whole idea is you wanna be able to group different events together into a category and assign an action and assign a label to it. That's really what you're doing. You're just grouping and identifying the events you're trying to track. And so in this case, I have this donate now button sitting in the header. Okay, in fact, I have a lot of things sitting in the header. So if I wanted to, and I wanna track all these buttons, I can create a category called header. And then if I track all these buttons, all these buttons can sit in that same category if I wanted to. Or I can create a separate category for each of these buttons. It's up to you how you organize your categories because basically all you're doing is giving a name to what you're trying to track and the name is equivalent to a category. So in this case, the donate now button's very important. I'm just gonna call it category header donate. Now, I need to give an action to each category. And so in this case, I'm just gonna say click because that's what the action is doing. It's, it's somebody's taking the action of clicking. Now, if it's a video and it's a play button, I can assign an action of play. It's up to you whatever you name these parameters. You just need to be organized and methodical about what you name it, that's all. And so in this case, header donate and then click, okay? And so that's our category in action. And so that's clearly step two. So step one, identify what you wanna track. Step two, assign a category, action, and or label. But remember, label is optional. So if I go back in analytics here, I could see some categories. And if I click on action, I could see some actions that I've named. Now, step three. So we've identified in step one what we want to track. We've assigned a category and action. So step three is going into Google Tag Manager to set up the event. Okay, so if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager, then you can easily just you know, do a Google search for Google Tag Manager, and basically you'll have all sorts of information on it. There's a good video overview of Tag Manager here that you can watch. So Tag Manager basically is what we want to use to set up event tracking. Now Tag Manager is used for a lot of different things, but the main thing we're doing here is setting up an event for our website. And so I'm logged in to the same email address I'm using for analytics, okay? So now I'm in Tag Manager and I want to set up my event for this Donate Now button. So what do I need to do? Well, for every event I wanna set up, I need to set up a tag, okay? So if I go to Tags, I can see I already have some tags set up and some of these are events. And so when you actually set up a tag, I recommend having a naming convention. So here you can see any event we set up, we start out by calling it GA-Event-Whatever it is we're trying to set up. And so in this case, we wanna set up a new tag for the Donate Now button on our website. So we're in Google Tag Manager because Tag Manager is what's gonna fire that event. So if I click on new, okay, and I click on tag configuration, I'm gonna choose Google Analytics. And then I'm going to choose event as my track type. So we want the data to show up in Google Analytics and we're tracking an event. We're not tracking a page view, we're tracking an event. And so now remember in step two, you identified what you wanna call that category, you identify what you wanna call that action, and you have some optional parameters like label. So first things first, header donates the name of our category and our action is click. And if you wanna add in a label and a value, 
So if you want to assign a value, you can. If you want to add in a label, you can. Okay, those are optional. So you just need to focus on category and action. And then the last setting here that's probably worth mentioning is a non-interaction hit. Okay, so this is automatically set to false. And why is it set to false? Because it's a non-interaction. No, that's false. We want this event, if somebody clicks on the header donate, to be an interaction. So for example, if I land on this page here and I click on that donate now button that I'm tracking as an event and I actually leave the site, because I have my settings set to false, I want that click to be an interaction, then analytics is not gonna count a bounce. If I change it to true, so from false to true, then that means it is going to be a non-interaction if somebody lands on the page and if somebody clicks on the button. So I don't want it to be a bounce. I want it to be an interaction. So my advice is leave it set to false. We're going to choose Google Analytics as our setting here. This is our variable for Google Analytics. So in other words, that variable is set to our analytics property ID. And more or less, that's what you need to do to set up the tag, okay? You need to, in step two, identify the category and action and or label and or value. Now, value can be anything you want. You're assigning a numerical value. So if you just assign one, anytime that event fires in analytics, it's gonna have a value of one, okay? And so we have our non-interaction set to false. So anytime the event fires, it's going to count as an interaction and therefore not count as a bounce if somebody landed on that page. So that's more or less all you need to do to set up the tag in Google Tag Manager. Now, if somebody else is setting up the tag for you, then again, you wanna to revert to step two. You wanna be able to give that person the appropriate category action and or label and or value. Why? Because you're the one that's gonna be going into Google Analytics and you're the one that's gonna have to go to behavior, events, top events, and look for the particular at category and action and or label. So you need to be able to communicate that information to whomever is setting up the tag. Now, if it's you, great. You already know what it is because you're entering that information into Tag Manager. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and choose a variable for my label parameter. And why do I wanna do that? Because in Tag Manager, I have something at my disposal called variables. And variables allow you to see specifically things that are being tracked. So in this case, I chose page path. Okay, so page path is a URL. And why did I choose page path as my variable for the parameter label? Because if somebody does click on the header donate button, and the header donate button on our website is on every page. So if I go to the children's page, I'm still gonna see that header donate button. And so for me, I wanna be able to see what page somebody clicked on that header donate button. And so this allows me to actually see in Google Analytics what page somebody clicked on the header donate down button. And so now if I go back to GTM, Google Tag Manager, I have a category, I have an action, and I have a label, which is a variable. Okay, so note that in Google Tag Manager, you have a lot of different variables at your disposal. And variables are there to help you identify specifically what is being tracked. So take a look at all the variables at your disposal in Tag Manager. In this example, I'm using page path. So now, once you set up your tag, pretty straightforward. Again, tag types, Google Analytics, track type is event. You are assigning the category action and or label and or value. You're changing or leaving the default in place for non-interaction hit. And then you're choosing the variable for Google Analytics, which is your property ID. So once you've done that, you have a tag. The second part of setting up a tag is to assign a trigger to that tag. So Tag Manager needs to be able to know when to fire that event. And so here I'm going to look at a trigger I've already set up for this particular event. And so if I click on it, I'll be able to see that what it is is a click on some links, not all links, but some links, I'm actually saying, hey, 
Google Tag Manager, fire this event when the click ID equals header donate button. Now it just so happens that if somebody did click on this donate now button, they're going to go to another website. In this case, networkforgood.com. So in Tag Manager, I could have set the trigger to equal URL equal instead of click ID. I could have said URL equal networkforgood.com. So that could have been my logic for my trigger. In this case, I decided to go with the click ID. And so in this case, that button has an ID associated with it called header donate button. So if you wanted to use click ID for your event, for your button, you could simply just go to the website. You can right click on that button and click inspect element. And so when I actually inspect the element, I can see now the button here. You can see it's highlighted in the upper pane and in the lower pane. I can see where it's linking to. It's linking to networkforgood.com. But here you can see if I hone in a little, I could see ID equals header dash donate dash button. So that's the click ID. Notice there's also a class. I could have set the trigger to equal this class. Or again, I could have set the trigger to equal the URL or the page that this button is pointing to. I could have chosen any one of those, but I decided to go with the ID. So this is the ID I chose and that's the ID I have in my trigger. Okay, so that is what's going to fire that event. So if somebody clicks on a button that equals header dash donate dash button, it's going to fire that event, which is going to equal category header donate action click and then the label is going to be page path so now that we've set up our event we want to test to see if it actually works so there's two ways to go about testing an event and the first way is through google analytics so if we go to google analytics and then we go to real time okay we can go to events and here you can see one is already fired so let's go ahead and go to and test this and go to the website. So if I go here, for example, and I click on Amagar alumni. Okay. So if I click on that, you can see I'm under our family. And if I click on that button then go back to analytics and look at real time, I should be able to see this event fire. So if I click on it, I'm going to go to network for good. Now, if I go back to analytics here in real time, under real time, under events, Per second, I can see that event firing. Category equals header donate. The action equals click. Now, if I click on the category, here I can see the label. The label, remember, was page path. And here you could see this event fired on the Our Family page, which was the page I was just on. So that's one way to test to see if your event works. And in this case, analytics recognized the event, so it works it fired and so therefore it's going to show up under behavior under events you can go under overview or top events okay and what am i going to look for in this case i'm going to look for header donate okay if i click on header donate as my category i'm going to be able to see my action and if i click on action i'll be able to see my label in this case home page and then later on when the data propagates in analytics i'll be able to see under label the page that I clicked on that header donate button, which is slash our family. Okay, the second way in which you can test to see if an event fires is if you preview. So if I click on preview in Tag Manager, okay, I'm gonna go into preview mode, okay? And preview mode allows you to see in analytics, in Tag Manager, and on the website, what tags are firing. So here I could see I'm in preview mode now. So I'm going to go to the website and I'm going to refresh and in my browser, same browser I'm using for tag manager, I can see the tags that are being fired on this page already. Okay. Cause I'm in preview mode. So here I could see remarketing. I could see page views. I could see Google optimize. I could see some tags that are already firing on this page. Now, if I click on this button here by holding down my shift command and then click on that button, I'll be able to see that 
the tag fired in preview mode. There's my event, header donate, and I could see it fired. So now I could see it fired in the preview mode. So in addition to Google Analytics, in preview mode, I could see that that tag is fired and I know that it's working. So there you have it, you have two ways to test to see if the event fires. Again, you have real time and analytics. Okay, so in real time, if you just go up to real time, all you need to do is go down to events, go to your website, click on the button. If you see it firing in real time, then you know it works. The second version or second way to test your event is through the preview mode. Okay, if you see it firing in preview mode, then you know it's also working. Okay, so let's rehash our steps. First step is we want to be able to identify what we want to track. Okay, so it could be this newsletter sign up, it could be click on a Facebook, it could be anything we want to be able to track. An image, a click on a CTA button, whatever we want to track, identify it. Second step, identify the category action and label because that's what's going to show up in Google Analytics. Remember, label is optional, variable, or excuse me, value is optional. Third step, go into Tag Manager, actually set up your tag and your trigger. So if you set up a tag and it's an event, name it GA-Event. That way you can see in your list of tags in Tag Manager what event tracking you have already set up. So when you set up your tag, you set up your trigger, your trigger is based on logic. That can be a URL, it can be a click ID, it can be a class ID, whatever you want to use to fire that event. And then once you do that, you want to test it. You could test it in GTM or you could test it in Google Analytics. If it doesn't fire, you want to tweak your trigger. If it does fire, then great. And then one thing I would recommend is if you're setting up various events for your website, that's a best practice. What I would recommend is set up a spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, you know, you want to put a note. What's firing? What are you doing to fire? It could be in this case, when somebody clicks on the donate now button in the header, you want to put the tag name in here, the type. Okay, then you want to record your category, action, and label. And then the great thing about events is you could turn those events into goals. And that's as simple as going back into analytics. Okay, so if I go in analytics and I go to admin and I go to goals, if you set up a new goal, okay, all you need to do is choose custom, click continue. You're going to choose event as your goal name. And then from a naming perspective in Google Analytics for your goal, I would definitely put event first and then click on header donate. Okay, so if I click now continue, what is my category? It's equal to header donate. My action is click. And so I can verify to see if this is working. And here I can see in analytics that the goal would have a 0.22% conversion rate. So that tells me that the goal is working and I can turn this event into a goal. And when you turn something into a goal in analytics, then you can measure it across all dimensions. That's what I would recommend if the event is equal to a KPI or business goal, or it's of importance. It's something you really want to measure. Okay, if it's just a click, say on a Facebook button, I wouldn't recommend setting that up as a goal. Okay, so once you've set up your event, you've recorded it in your spreadsheet, it's firing, you want to be able to then go back into behavior, back into events. Okay, you can go to top events. Okay, so top events tell you by category as a default, what events are firing or what category is firing the most. Okay, so if I choose my date range here, I can just go to here to date. So here I can see my header donate button, fortunately for me, has the most total events. Now notice in analytics, you also see unique events. And so the difference between unique events and total events is that unique events are equivalent to one per session, where total events means that somebody can come to your website initiate a session and click on that button multiple times in the same session. So if I go to the Alma Foundation website, okay, I can click on that donate now button three or four or five different times in the same session. So what analytics is going to do is actually 
in that session, count it once, but accumulate the number of clicks as a total event for that session. So you're always gonna have more total events than unique events because in some cases, users may click on the button more than once in the same session. And so here I can see total events, unique events, and if I added a value to that event, I should be able to see it here. So if I added a dollar as an example to this particular event, because it had 164 unique events, I should be able to see 164 as my value. But since I see zero, that means that I did not assign value. And so average value basically is just giving me how much average I have per event. So it's taking into account the number of, or the value, the total value divided by the total number of unique page views or sessions. And so because I don't have value, I'm not gonna have average value. But here you could see, because value is optional, here I can at least see how many events or how many clicks I receive for a particular button. Again, it could be a video. If I clicked on this video as an example, I can see how many people actually started it. I can see the unique and the total events. And if I click on label, if I have a label assigned, then I'll be able to see what page triggered that event. So if we go back again to our header donate button, back to category, if we click on label as our primary dimension. Here we can see the home page had the most unique events, then followed by the children's page, the contact form, etc. So what you can do in analytics, you can also look at the pages that have driven events. So here I could see the home page has accumulated the most total events, followed by the contact us. So that's how you would look at the data in Google Analytics under behavior, under events, and then under top events or overview is where you can start analyzing your event tracking. So first you need to do, identify it, assign a category, action, and or label, set up that tag and trigger. Once you do that, once you test that it's working, this is where you're gonna go to analyze the data. Let's start out with YGTM. So let's just say you're Sam and you have your own e-commerce website and you want to understand how people are interacting with your website. Well, Sam, today's world of websites contain a lot of interactivity, everything from videos to PDF downloads to commenting to form submissions uh, to all sorts of chat functionality, interactivity going on throughout the website. So there's just a lot that you need to track outside of just page views. And so really what GTM does is they help you track all these things I just mentioned. Everything from somebody clicking on the play button of a PDF to somebody clicking on the submit button of a form to somebody entering in something on a chat function. So that's what GTM is. So why GTM? Because it helps us track all that interactivity. So all GTM is, is really allows you to really place a piece of Java code, which is just script. And the script that's added to a web page to collect information. So that's really what a tag is. It's just some script that gets put on a web page in order for you to collect information, like page views, clicks, etc. And they send it to third party tools. Okay, so that's what GTM does. It, it basically allows you to take all these tags that collect information and you can use them in GTM. So if you want to, for example, collect how many people you know enter a chat functionality and start chatting well you're going to take that script and you're going to put it in gtm and gtm will then allow you to start tracking that information so that's really what gtm is it just allows you to put tags into a container or think of it as a toy box you have all these toys and you want to track well you can put all those those toys or tags in a toy box or container and we're going to talk a little bit more about that but before we get into GTM, let's just say, you know, you're communicating with your developer and there's a new user request on your web page and you want to update the tag. Well, your developer, considering it's probably a small update to your website, is probably going to not um, 
hesitate and is going to go ahead and turn around and do it normally. And so normally what happens is the developer is going to go to the website and update the tag. Well, what if you have a few things that you want to track? All these things I mentioned before from downloads to clicks to, you know, somebody checking out to watching a video. Well, your webmaster, your web developer is going to go, well, hold on a second. Now, all these requests are going to take time. I need to put them into the work queue, so to speak. Well, what happens is when they go into work queue, usually it's going to take some time. And in some cases, you as a marketer need to launch a campaign. And you want to get that tracking uh, added to the website in time for the campaign launch. So you want to go ahead and quickly turn around the tracking for that particular campaign. Let's just say you're launching a campaign and you're sending people to a landing page that has a form submission. And you want to be able to track how many people click on the submit button of that form submission. Well, if you need to turn that around, your developer's like, well, I need to put that in a work queue. The timing isn't going to always work out between you and your developer is my point. And so that's where GTM comes in because there is a solution to update your tags faster and that's Google Tag Manager. So when we say GTM, that's what GTM stands for, Google Tag Manager. It's a place for you to add tags quickly and easily. So tags, remember, are just snippets of code that allow you to track things on your website interactively. Interactive actively. And basically, when you have GTM, you can bypass the webmaster and do it quickly and easily. So that's what GTM is all about. So why GTM? Because we just identified two benefits. One, you could track all the interactivity on your website. And two, you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And so that's the benefit of GTM. So the benefit, you get those tags updated very quickly via Google Tag Manager. Okay, so that's what Tag Manager is. So what we're gonna talk about today is specifically what Tag Manager is and what it does. We're gonna list some of the benefits of Tag Manager. We're gonna show you how it works. And then we're gonna show you how to get started with Tag Manager. Tag Manager, if you're not familiar with working with webmasters and dealing with JavaScript and tags and all this jargon is just new to you today, okay, well, don't fret, sit back. We're gonna take it slow. This is an introduction into Google Tag Manager. Again, let's start out with what is Tag Manager. So we've already introduced it to some degree because we already introduced it as a tool where you can put all your tags into a toolbox, toy box, or container, so to speak, right? And we already already mentioned that, hey, you can bypass your webmaster. So you're probably thinking, well, if, I'm, if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, how can I bypass my webmaster? Well, first of all, it's a free tool, and it's a Google tool, hence the name Google Tag Manager. And it helps you really, that's the main point, is deploy and track tags on your website, bypassing your webmaster. So that's Tag Manager. And so examples of tags that can be deployed via Google Tag Manager are numerous. These are just some examples like Google Analytics, Facebook pixel tracking, or Google Ads. There's no limit into the number of tags you can track in Tag Manager. There is no limit. You can add any number of tracking tags in Tag Manager. Okay, so some of the benefits, well again, I, we just listed two. You can put any tag into Tag Manager and track that onto your website. And we know you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And what it also does is it also allows you to test and deploy your JavaScript codes quicker. So remember, these JavaScript codes or snippets of codes are just there to track certain things on your website, whether that be a page view or somebody clicking on a play button or tracking somebody who converts or even just goes to your website. So the biggest benefit is you can take that snippet of code, let's just say Facebook. Let's just say you're doing Facebook marketing and you wanna put that Facebook pixel on your website so that you could track people who come from Facebook and convert. Well, you don't need to put that Facebook pixel on your website. You can go right to Tag Manager and you can put that snippet of code right in Tag Manager really quickly. And the other benefit here is all tags are managed in one place. And that's that to me is really a good benefit because when you start adding tags on your website and you have some tags in Tag Manager, it just gets very confusing. So ideally, all the tracking code you have on your website needs to be in Tag Manager. 
Think about that, all the tracking. So if you're doing Bing, or you're doing Facebook, or you're doing Twitter, or you're doing LinkedIn, and you're doing Google, you're doing all this type of marketing on all these different platforms, you're gonna have tracking code for all these different platforms. And instead of putting all that code on your website, return gonna slow down the slow, low time of your web page and website. You wanna put them all in Tag Manager so they can be organized, and you know exactly what you're trying to track. And the other great benefit of Tag Manager is there's a versioning control so let's just say you have added tags to your website via GTM for the last six months well and let's just say you add another tag yesterday if you added that tag yesterday and something doesn't work well you can just roll back to a previous version it's that simple so you have versioning and that's that's a good thing when you have versioning you can control what gets published and if something doesn't work after it gets published then you can roll back to a previous version so it's a a peace of mind so to speak just because you've had code to your site there's no guarantee it's going to work and so you can always control what version you're dealing with in tag manager and we'll talk a little bit more about that so the biggest benefit here to me with Tag Manager is you have event tracking. And so we talked about some of the things you could track on your website from videos, from play buttons to somebody clicking on the stop on the video or pausing it all the way to somebody again chatting or let's just say somebody clicking on that purchase button on your website. Okay, and you want to track all these different things, these different interactivities and buttons. Well, event tracking is what you're going to use to track all those buttons. And to me, this is the biggest benefit of Tag Manager. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. And if we didn't mention it already, I'll mention it again. It is free. Tag Manager is free. There's no limit. So once you have Tag Manager going, you can add as many tracking codes as you want. There's no limit on the number of tracking codes you can add to Tag Manager, okay? So it's free and you can use it to its fullest advantage, okay? So it's also high security, meaning that it has different levels of permissions, okay? So you can have uh, somebody just go in and look at the different tags and tracking codes you have in GTM. Or you can ask somebody who is very familiar with Tag Manager and can go in and add the tracking code to Tag Manager and then publish that tracking code when it gets added. So those are all the benefits. Let's talk about how it works now. Specifically, how does Tag Manager work? Because you're like, Rob, okay, again, a lot of jargon. You know, you, you, you got tags and JavaScript and, and versioning and publishing and all this other stuff. Well, I know I'm throwing a lot at you at once, but just bear with me here, okay? So let's start talking about how it actually works. So you have a website, okay? Whatever that domain is, you have a website and there's chances are on your website, you have some form of interactivity, whether that be a video, whether that be a blog, whether it be a form submission. You have a website with some interactivity. And let's just say you're even thinking about getting ready to launch some type of campaign on maybe Google or Facebook and you wanna drive traffic to your website. Fair enough. You're joining the millions of other websites that are out there that have interactivity that also drive traffic to the website. So in comes Google Tag Manager. And so Tag Manager is important because again, we know we wanna track people coming from that Facebook campaign or that Google campaign and interacting with our site. So if you are running Facebook and you are running Google Analytics, well, guess what? You wanna put that tracking code in Tag Manager. So Google Analytics being a Google product works very nicely with Tag Manager. Facebook has its own tracking code, but you still wanna be able to track people who come from the Facebook campaign to your website. So you're gonna get that tracking code from Facebook and put it in Tag Manager. That's generally how it works. So here, information from your website is shared with another data source through Tag Manager. So think about that. If I add Facebook tracking code to Tag Manager, or let's just say I add Google Analytics tracking code to Tag Manager, Tag Manager is the one that's pushing out and doing all the heavy lifting. They're the ones that are controlling what code gets fired and what code doesn't. So if you're putting the code in Tag Manager, Tag Manager's controlling the code. Think about it that way. And let's show you an example of what that looks like. So here I am, I'm in Tag Manager. I just went to tagmanager.google.com and here I could see a list of tags. So 
In our conversation, we're talking about tracking Facebook and we're talking about tracking Google Analytics. Well, Google Analytics is easy because it's a Google product. So here, if I look at all the different tracking code I have on my website through Tag Manager, let's just take a look at Google Analytics. So if you're gonna use Tag Manager, you might as well put the Google Analytics code in here. So here I can see I have Google Analytics as a tag in Tag Manager. Now, for Facebook, if I'm running a Facebook campaign, well, I can take that pixel tracking and put it in GTM as well. And here I could see Facebook pixel. That is, that code is added to GTM. I just basically took what Facebook gave me and put it into Google Tag Manager. So you can see I can add Facebook and Google Analytics. And again, I can't stress it enough, any tracking code from any platform, I can add to Google Tag Manager in order to track the behavior from those sources. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into how Tag Manager works. Work. So I just showed you an example of how you could take Facebook and Google Analytics code and put it into Tag Manager. But if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, then how do I do that? Well, let's talk about the structure and how Tag Manager works. So when you have a Tag Manager account, you have a container. Remember, I mentioned Toy Box earlier. You have a bunch of toys if they're their code and you're tracking different bits of code from different platforms like Facebook. Think of those as toys and you have a toy box. Okay, well that's what this code is and that's what a container is. The code is the code and that's gonna go into the toy box or container. And so the way Tag Manager works is you have tags, triggers, and variables. So if I take my Facebook tracking code and put it into a container, I need to set up a tag and a trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at what that is. So first, if I go back to Tag Manager, I'm gonna have an account and if I have an account, I'm going to have a container. So here I'm just gonna click on an account with a container and a container is nothing more than what website you're adding the tracking code to. Okay, that's all the container is. We're just letting Tag Manager know this is the website we're adding all this code to. So you have tags, triggers, and variables. That's the structure of Tag Manager. So tags are just what it says, tags. What are we trying to quote unquote tag? Well, if it's Google Analytics, that's easy. Here I could see I have Google Analytics added. So if I click on Google Analytics, here's my tag. And if I take a little bit of a deeper dive there, since Google, Analytics is a Google product. It integrates already with Tag Managers. It's pretty easy. I can just choose Google Analytics. Then I'm gonna check Page View, and that's my tag. Now, every tag needs a trigger, okay? So I need to tell Tag Manager how or when to fire the Google Analytics tracking code. So in this case, I'm gonna tell Tag Manager to fire on all pages. So if I get somebody, a visitor to my website, Analytics is firing on all pages. So whatever page that visitor lands on, Google Analytics is gonna fire. So that's really what it comes down to is I have a tag and I need to tell Tag Manager when to trigger that tag. That's really what the structure of Tag Manager is. It's tags, triggers, and variables, and variables what we're gonna talk about here in a couple minutes. But you have a piece of code, you're gonna go ahead and put that into Tag Manager, you're gonna tag it, and then you're going to fire that trigger. So let's take a look at another example here. If I go back here, you can see Facebook. Well, here's my Facebook pixel, okay, that's my tag. So when is it gonna fire? Well, it's gonna fire on a specific domain or subdomain. That's basically what we're doing. We're trying to tell GTM when to fire that particular tag. So those are the three main components, a tag, okay, which is going to contain the JavaScript code that you get from say Facebook, the trigger, so you're going to go into Tag Manager and tell Tag Manager when to fire that code, that's the trigger, and then you have variables. And so variables are basically just additional information that Tag Manager may need for your tag and trigger to work. So that's what a variable is. It's there to get the tag and trigger to fire. So variables are divided into built-in and user-defined variables. So common user variables include say page path or page URL or host name or click class. Again, 
they're there and these examples I just gave you are there to get your tag and trigger to work. Think about it that way. They're just, that's a component. And if I go into tag manager here and here on the left side, I can see variables. So remember I have built in and user defined. So built in means that tag manager already built these for me. So in case I need to get my trigger to work with my tag, I can use a variable. So those are built in and then I have user defined. So these are what I define. These are what I created. And again, the variables are there to get the tag and trigger to work. Okay. So that's the job of the variable. The job of the tag is to host that JavaScript code. Okay. In the case of Facebook or analytics, that's where we're putting our code. So here, if I click on AdWords remarketing, again, it's a Google product. So I don't really need to even deal with code. I'm just going to select Google AdWords remarketing. Okay. So you could see GTM integrates nicely with some of the other Google products, but let's just say you have a Facebook pixel tracking code. You're going to choose custom and you're going to put the code here. So that's part of the tag. And then the trigger again is there to get the tag to fire. So you're telling GTM when to fire the tag and the variable is there to help you make sure that that trigger and that tag work together. So that's how all three kind of work together. You need the tag to put the code. You need the trigger to tell GTM when to fire the tag and code and the variables there to help you define when that tag and trigger should work or how it should work. So again, review tags are, they're just small codes of JavaScript or tracking pixels on your website. And so tags are allowed to manage events like scroll tracking, remarketing, clicks, downloads, files, play buttons, you name it, even clicks on external links. For example, let's just say you have a click uh, or a Facebook uh, icon on your site. And when somebody clicks on it, they go to Facebook. You want to maybe track that. You're going to create a tag. Okay? The trigger is there because you need to tell GTM when to fire that tag. So it's a certain condition, whether it's, you know, fire the tag if the URL equals facebook.com or some other condition. So the tag cannot be created until the creation of the corresponding trigger. So tags and triggers go together. You can't just create a tag and not have a trigger. Otherwise your tag will never fire. And then the variable is there again. It stores the information when defining a trigger or transferring data to tag. So a variable has a variety of data. Okay. So you pick and choose the variable you want to use with that trigger. Okay. So you're making sure that by defining a variable, you're making sure that you're telling GTM how that trigger should be fired. So let's take a look at another example here of how all three play together. If I'm in this account, I'm in this container. If I look down here, I could see Google optimize. That's another Google product. So what I'm doing here is I just chose Google optimize as my tag. It's already integrated. So what does that mean? I don't even need to deal with any code. I'm just going to select optimize. Well, we have the tag Google optimize, but we need to tell GTM how to fire that. And so here we're going to tell GTM to fire it on all pages. So that's basically a very simple example because we're firing it on all pages. So if I want to look at something specific again, Facebook, here's my tag, here's my code. What's my trigger? Well, my trigger is it's going to fire on specific pages. How do I know that? Well, if I look at the trigger here, I could see the trigger is a page view, but I'm telling it to fire on this particular host name. So the tag and trigger go hand in hand. So how to get started with Tag Manager. So first things first, you have to create that account. So you're going to go to tagmanager.google.com or you can do a search for Google Tag Manager and you're going to create your account. And then when you create your account, what's going to happen is you're going to set up a container. 
And when you set up a container, you have choices. So you could set it up for your website, for an app on iOS, or maybe Android, or you can even set it up for AMP, an accelerated mobile page. So most people by default are probably gonna set up Tag Manager for their website. And so when you do that, when you actually select website, what's gonna happen is you're going to get some Google Tag Manager code in return. And so the whole idea here is you're going to do a swap. What you're doing is basically you're saying, okay, Google, I'm gonna take this Google Tag Manager code and I'm gonna put it on my website. I'm gonna put it on every page of my website. So notice Tag Manager has two scripts. One goes in the head as high as possible. The other goes into the body tag as high as possible. And so what you're doing is you're making a deal. You're putting this tag manager code on your website and in return, every code you deal with, whether that be Facebook or analytics or optimize or remarketing or whatever it is, is gonna go in GTM. Okay, it's gonna go into the container you created. So you need the tag manager code on your website in order for tag manager to work. Okay, so when you add this code to your website, then you're free to start adding all sorts of tags to your container. But if you don't have this tracking code on your website, then none of the tags you add to your container are gonna work. So that's the idea behind the container. And then one thing I wanted to mention on the account is it's a Google account. So when you create your account, then make sure it's the same account you use with say Google Analytics or some other Google product. That's a good best practice is always use the same email address when you set up your account so that it integrates nicely across all the different platforms. Meaning you can go from say Google Analytics right to Google Tag Manager in one browser without having to log out or log in. Okay, so when you create the account, you're gonna create your container. If you choose web, then you're gonna be asked to place code on your website. And when you place that code on your website, then you are free to start using Tag Manager. And that means you're free to start adding tags. Okay, so if you wanna know more information about installing Google Tag Manager, then what I would recommend is visit the Quick Start Guide website of GTM. So again, if you're curious as to where that code is located in Google Tag Manager, well, when you create an account and you create a container, that container is gonna have a specific ID. So if I click on that specific ID, here's where I can get my code, okay? So again, when I'm logged in to Tag Manager, I'm gonna click on Workspace, but in the top navigation, I'm gonna see my unique GTM ID. If I click on that, that's where my code is gonna be located. And so again, your code needs to go in the header, and there's another script that needs to go in the body. And if you're not sure how to add the code to your website, well, you can always click on the quick start guide here, okay? And that'll take you to a quick start guide page, a reference page related to Google Tag Manager. So let's talk about creating a tag. So once you get Tag Manager installed, I'm sure you're excited to get going and create that first tag. So let's talk about how to create a tag in Tag Manager. So when you're in Tag Manager, all you need to do is Basically, you're looking at all your tags. If you click on tag in the left side navigation, you'll see all your tags and there's a new button there. So you just click new. And so basically what you're gonna do is you're going to create your first tag. And so what I would recommend, once you get Tag Manager installed on your website, I would recommend setting the first tag up as Google Analytics. So that will get you going with tracking page views on your website when some when somebody visits your website, okay? So ideally, that's what you wanna do. You wanna get Google Analytics as your first tag and tag manager. So what I'm gonna do is because Analytics is a Google product, it's already integrated nicely with Tag Manager. So I'm just gonna click on Google Analytics. It's going to be a page view, that's what I'm tracking. And now I have to set up a variable. And so what it's going to do, it's gonna ask me to set up a, select a variable. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna select new variable. And what you're going to do is you're actually gonna go and add your tracking ID here. That's gonna be your variable. So where do I get my tracking ID in analytics? Well, if I'm in analytics, I'm gonna to go to admin 
And then under property settings, I'm gonna see my tracking ID. And all you need to do then is go to Tag Manager and paste copy. First, you gotta copy over that tracking ID. Then you're gonna go to Tag Manager and gonna paste it. And then that's gonna create a variable for you. And then when you create that variable, you're gonna see it in the drop down here. So I've already created it. And basically, that's your tag with a variable. Then what are you gonna do? You're gonna set up a trigger. So see, I have some triggers already set up. You're gonna see a default trigger already set up for you, and that's gonna be all pages. So ideally what you wanna do is you wanna select all pages in order for analytics to fire on all pages. So that's what we're doing. We're setting up a trigger. We're basically telling Tag Manager, hey, if I get a visitor to any page on my website, then I want you to fire Google Analytics. So that's basically, in summary, how to set up your first tag. And my recommendation is your first tag should be Google Analytics. And when you set up analytics, you're gonna have to set up a variable for the tracking ID. And so you get the tracking ID again from admin, property settings, copy and paste that tracking ID over, save it, you have your variable, that variable is gonna be included in with the tag, then your trigger is gonna be all pages. And there you go, you have your first tag, you have your first variable, you have your first trigger. So that's basically what you wanna do. And once you've added that tag, once you've added that trigger, then the only thing you need to do now is basically publish the tag. And so anytime you save a tag, you're going to go ahead and submit it so that way it gets published. So again, what you're gonna do is let's take a step back here. You're going to choose new tag. You're gonna choose analytics from the drop down menu. You're gonna choose page view. Then basically you're going to add your tracking ID so you could set up the variable. And then basically that's what you need to do. Okay, you're gonna add that tracking ID and then voila, that's your tag with a variable. And then once you've done that, then you're going to click submit. So when you click submit, you're basically saying, hey, I want this tag to go live now, this tag and trigger. And once you've done that, then analytics is ready to go. And anytime somebody goes to your website on any page, Tag Manager is gonna fire Google Analytics. So the great thing here is you have something called Google Tag Assistant, and that's a, an extension that works with Chrome. And so when you've actually added Tag Manager to your site, or you have analytics running in Tag Manager, you can confirm if those tags are firing properly. So let's take a look at how Google Tag Assistant works. Okay, so if you just do a search for Google Tag Assistant, you're gonna see here that it's basically just an extension that works in Chrome, and it unfortunately it only works in Chrome browser. It doesn't work in any other browser. So go ahead and install that extension into Chrome. And when you do that, you're gonna see this nice icon here in your browser. And now, if you go to any website and I click on Google Tag Assistant and I click on Enable, okay, so basically I'm loading Google Tag Assistant. And now once I refresh the page, I can see that this particular site has Google Tag Manager installed. And not only does it have Tag Manager installed, I can see that it also has Google Analytics running, I have also Google Optimize running, and I have Google Ads Remarketing Tag running in Tag Manager. So that's what Tag Assistant does. It allows you to see if one, Tag Manager is on the site, and if it is, great, what other tags are firing on this particular site? So Tag Assistant's telling me I have these particular tags firing on that site, and they're firing within Tag Manager. So Tag Assistant is a great way to confirm if one, Tag Manager's on the site, and two, what other tags are firing on the site. Now. Another way you could confirm if Tag Manager is firing on the site is you can go into preview mode. So even before you submit and publish your tag and trigger, you can click on the preview mode. So if I click preview in Tag Manager, so basically that's going to put me in preview mode. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that now I'm free to go to my website and see if those tags are firing. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go to the website and just click refresh, then what's gonna happen is Tag Manager is gonna load in preview mode, just as you see here. Okay, so that's gonna take a second, couple seconds to load up. 
And now what can I see in preview mode? I could see that I have GTM firing, but I also have some other tags firing on this page. Remarketing, I have Google Analytics, I have Google Optimize. I have some other tags firing as well. And so the preview mode shows me what tags are firing on any given page. And I can also see what tags did not fire. Okay, so here I have a number of tags already in GTM, but they didn't fire on this particular page. So let's just say I clicked on the donate now button. I'm still in preview mode. So I'm gonna be able to see what tags fired. Now I could see I have a couple of tags that have fired on this particular page. And then I could see what tags did not fire on this page, okay? So that's the preview mode. You can use the preview mode before you even submit a tag and trigger to see if it fires. And that's the great benefit of Tag Manager. So if you're not sure if something's going to fire or not, then you can always go into preview mode. Um, and if you are sure it's gonna fire, then you can go ahead and submit it. So you can leave preview mode and just go ahead and submit that particular tag and trigger. So here I'm gonna leave preview mode. And now once I'm done and I'm sure the tag is gonna fire and go ahead and submit all my changes that I've worked on in terms of setting up tags and triggers. So that's really GTM in a nutshell. So I have my tags, okay, my tags are just snippets of code that I'm gonna put in, whether that be Facebook or vet tracking or any other Google product like Optimize or PageView. Then I have my triggers. My triggers are there to tell GTM when to fire that tag. And the variables are there to help those tags and triggers work together. So remember that particular variable we set up for Google Analytics, okay, so here it is right here because we want to tell GTM what property to specifically fire in Google Analytics. So that's why we set up that variable. But there are all sorts of variables. Google Tag Manager has built in or variables already created for you or you can specifically define a variable. So variables are there to help the tags and triggers work together. So when you set up a tag, you set up a trigger, you use a variable, you can always go into preview mode, preview it by going to the website, seeing if it fires. If it fires, then voila, you can go ahead and click submit and that will publish the tag and trigger and you're good to go. That's pretty much how Tag Manager works. And again, I can't stress that there is an unlimited number of tags you can add to Tag Manager. There's no limit. So you got everything from anything from Google to non-Google to event tracking, okay? To Facebook, to anything that you wanna track, you wanna be able to put into Tag Manager. And again, there's versioning. That's one of the great benefits of Tag Manager. So if I wanna go back to an older version, I can simply do that. So here you can see I'm on version 32. That's how Tag Manager works. And I can't stress that, you know, Tag Manager is there to help you track interactivity on the site. Because if you have a site that's interactive, that has a video, that has a download button, let's just say, you know, you have all sorts of newsletter signups, Facebook, YouTube buttons on your website, just like this website does, and you want to be able to track how many people click on that particular button, well, you're going to need Tag Manager. And when you have Tag Manager, you're going to be able to track all of these button clicks and interactivity on your website. Without Tag Manager, it's going to be hard to do that. So that's an introduction to Tag Manager. Today, we're going to talk about how to rank number one on Google. So let's get started and um, let's go with the scenario that you have a friend named Sam and he has a website where he sells shoes. But Sam doesn't understand why his website's not ranking number one on Google. And so typically, to rank number one on Google, there are some factors involved. And those are factors that are gonna help Sam get his website rank number one on Google so he can sell his shoes, get traffic and convert that traffic to conversions. So there are factors involved. And so what are those factors? Well, 
It always starts with keyword research. So in order to rank for a website where you sell shoes or you sell products, other products like clothing or food, or you're an automobile website, you know, you're a mechanic, it doesn't matter whether you're selling to customers or selling to other businesses. You have to start with the keyword research. And so we're going to go into really explicit detail on how to conduct a proper keyword research. And then the second factor involved is high quality content. So in order to rank high on Google search, you need to have high quality content. So we're going to go over what's involved with creating high quality content. Then we're going to take that content. We're going to optimize it using on page elements and website level factors. So we're going to take into account what's involved with your website and what's involved with specific pages on your website in order to rank number one on Google. Then we're going to get into the offsite engagement. So when it comes to ranking on Google, you need to optimize your website and you need to do some elements off your website. You need to be engaging off your website, meaning on other websites. And so we're going to talk about what's involved with offsite engagement. So SEO being a major channel for most companies and websites where the opportunity to drive a lot of traffic is there, but you have to earn that reward. The reward is a lot of traffic, but you have to earn the reward and there's a lot of work involved. And so ideally what we want to do is follow what we call the 80 20 rule when it comes to search engine optimization and ranking on Google. And what do we mean by the 80 20 rule? Well, 80 20 means we're investing 20% of our effort and 80% of the results are obtained. So we want to invest 20 and get back 80. That's basically what we mean by 80 20. So for example, if 20% of our targeted keywords bring in 80% of the traffic, then that's following the 80-20 rule. Or 20% of our landing pages drive 80% of the overall traffic, that's following the 80-20 rule. Or 20% of our backlinks pass 80% of our link juice, that's the 80-20 rule. Meaning these targeted keywords, these targeted landing pages, these trying to target backlinks using off-site engagement. We want to put in 20% of our effort on those keywords, landing pages, and backlinks in return for 80% of the results. So without further ado, let's get started with the keyword research. Let's talk about that keyword research for a website with shoes. And, and it doesn't really matter what particular product you have. If you need to rank number one on Google, it all starts with the keywords as I mentioned before. And so in this example, if you have a website where you sell shoes for kids, you're going to want to be found for certain keywords. So the obvious keyword here would be shoes for kids. Well, every keyword that you target has search volume associated with it. So that means when we talk about search volume, we're talking about how many people on average type in that keyword or related keyword on google.com or Google search. And there's always an average number of searches associated with every keyword. And we call that search volume. How much search volume? So obviously if we're gonna target a keyword, we wanna have as much volume as possible. However, there's always going to be competition for those keywords, meaning there's always gonna be other websites who wanna rank number one on Google for the same keywords. And we call that competition or difficulty. So for every keyword, you're going to have volume and you're going to have competition or difficulty. And the difficulty ranges as well, depending on the tool you use. And we'll get into that in a minute, but search volume is how much on average people are typing in that keyword or close variants of that keyword. And the difficulty is measured in terms of how many other websites are trying to rank for the same keyword. And so ideally, when it comes to keyword research, we wanna find that nice balance. We want high volume and we want low competition. But at the same time, we wanna focus on keywords that are highly relevant to our business. So if we're selling shoes for kids and shoes for kids is highly relevant, has high volume and low competition, then that's a keyword we wanna target. So we always wanna focus in on those three areas. So there's always a trade-off with keywords. 
So shoes for kids might have high volume, but also might have high competition or difficulty. If we look for another keyword that's just as relevant, for example, shoes for children, it may still have high search volume, but the competition or the difficulty may be lower. And if that's the case, then that may be a better keyword for us to target. Instead of something highly competitive like shoes for kids, we can focus on another relevant keyword like shoes for children with just as much volume and lower competition. And the reason why we want lower competition is because we want to be able to rank for that keyword. So the higher the competition, the harder it is for us to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And so the whole idea beyond keyword research is analyzing and choosing the best keywords. So we want to identify a list of keywords that are always relevant. We want to choose the keyword that your competitors are ranking for. And we want to use third party tools to choose keywords to identify which keywords have low competition and what keywords have high search volume. So one thing to take into consideration when you're doing keyword research is that the longer the keyword phrase, or in other words, long tail keywords, or keywords with three keywords in the phrase or more, you're gonna always have less competition, but there's always a trade-off. With long tail keywords, meaning the longer the keyword phrase, there's gonna be less volume, but the trade-off is less competition. And so what we wanna do is we wanna brainstorm some ideas and find those relevant keywords. So let's look at an example here. So if we go to Google Ads, so Google Ads has a tool called Keyword Planner. And let's just say I have a, a website where I'm selling dried figs. And if I'm selling dried figs, I want people to buy these dried figs. However, in order to attract them, I want to be able to show them that, hey, we have a, a bunch of recipes. And if I show you a bunch of recipes where you can use dried figs, maybe you'll buy these dried figs to use in these recipes. And so we're going to look for keywords related to bread recipes because if we can optimize for our recipes page for bread then that will attract an audience who wants to make bread and use dried figs with those bread recipes so that's the example i'm going to give here and so if i look at the keyword planner in google ads if i just type in bread recipes what google is going to do is they're going to give me an average monthly search volume so i can see the average monthly search volume here here is 60,500. And so in order to do keyword research, what I would recommend is keep a spreadsheet. And so the idea behind the spreadsheet is to document the volume and the competition you're getting for certain keywords. So if I go into a spreadsheet, here, my theme of keywords is bread recipes. My keyword is bread recipes, and my volume, therefore, is going to be 60,500. However, if I go back into Google's Keyword Planner, Google's telling me the competition is low. So that's great. I want high volume, I want low competition. But how low is low? So we want to be careful. So if we're going to put in numbers into a spreadsheet, we want to figure out what that competition really is for the keyword bread recipes. So if I go to Google and just type in bread recipes, I'm going to be able to see 771 billion results for the keyword bread recipes. Now, is 771 billion our real competition? Maybe, maybe not. What we want to do is put in a syntax and we want to put in the syntax all in title and then colon, space, and then our keyword. And the reason why we do that in search is because we want to be able to identify the true competitive number or the true number of websites who are trying to rank for bread recipes and if we put in the syntax all in title colon and then our keyword bread recipes we'll be able to see that there are 998,000 results that's a lot lower than 771 billion so that means that 998,000 sites or listings have the keyword bread recipes in the title tag. And the title tag is what shows up in the search engine results. And so if I look down and scroll down here, I can see bread recipes are in every one of these title tags. So title tag is an important element to rank number one on Google. And we'll talk about that 
in a few minutes. But if we understand that there are 998,000 results with bread recipes in the title tag, then this tells us that those are the websites who are trying to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And therefore, those are the websites we need to jump over in order for our website to rank number one on Google. And so therefore, I'm gonna put in 998,000 in my spreadsheet as the competitive number. And so now I could see for the keyword bread recipes, I have 60,500. And if my comp competition is 998,000, then my KEI or keyword effectiveness index, or in other words, the ratio of volume to competition is 6%. So that's nothing more than volume divided by competition. So that tells me that my KEI or my ratio between volume and competition is 6%. So remember, we want more volume than we want competition. So anytime you do a keyword research, you're going to find a number of different relevant keywords words. So if I go back into Google's keyword planner, if I typed in bread recipes, you could see that Google is going to give me a number of different keywords related to bread recipes. Let's just say I have another keyword that I want to think about optimizing for being ranked on Google for and that's banana bread recipe. Very similar keyword as bread recipes except it's a little longer tail. Now if I type in banana bread recipe in Google's keyword planner, now I can see the average monthly search volume has actually gone up. It's 368,000. I can also see the competition is low. So those are good signs. So now I can see 368,000. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in my spreadsheet. Now I'm gonna go into Google. I'm gonna put in my syntax all in title. I'm gonna put in banana bread recipe. I'm gonna hit enter. And now I can see I have 233,000 results with the keyword banana bread recipe in the title tag. So if I look at the title tags, I can see banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe banana bread recipe on all the listings in the Google search results. So that tells me I have 233,000 results that I have to jump over in order to rank number one on Google. So I'm gonna put 233,000 in my spreadsheet. Now I can see my KEI or my volume to competition ratio is 157, 158%. And so to me, that's a lot better number to work with, or in other words, that's a lot better keyword because it's just as relevant and it has a higher ratio of volume to competition. So therefore, banana bread recipe is going to be a better keyword to optimize for in order to rank number one on Google. So that's the whole idea behind keyword research. You wanna brainstorm ideas. There are plenty of tools out there. So the tool I recommend is Google Ads Keyword Planner. Google's gonna give you how much search volume. They're gonna tell you the competition, but then you're gonna go into Google search. You're gonna use the syntax all in title to get a more accurate read on the actual competitive number. And so to find out how keywords that your competitors are ranking for, you can use those keyword tools that I mentioned. Another tool that I use is Moz. So Moz, if you go to moz.com, they have a tool called Keyword Explorer. So if we just type in the keyword, for example, bread recipes, it's gonna be able to tell us how much volume and the difficulty. So you can use other tools at your disposal, figure out the volume and the difficulty. There are plenty of tools out there. But the one thing I would just make sure is you use everything at your disposal. So you can use social media to find the most shared article for a particular topic or keyword like bread recipes. You could check other platforms that have a lot of shared content like Reddit and Quora, where you can ask people about certain topics using keywords to figure out how much competition or volume there might be. You could stay up to date on industry news to get an idea of what types of keywords are trending. But when it comes to keywords and keyword research, remember for every web page, we wanna be able to pick two keywords. We want a primary and secondary keyword. So when we do keyword research, 
and we enter all our keywords into our spreadsheet, we want to be able to have a number of different keywords. In this case, we're focusing on the theme bread recipes. We want to have different keywords because we want to be able to choose a primary keyword and a secondary keyword because we want to be able to focus on multiple keywords for each page because we don't want to put necessarily all our eggs in one basket, meaning we won't want to put all our emphasis just on one keyword to rank for. We want multiple keywords to try and rank for. So the primary keyword can define the nature of our business. The secondary keyword could be just highly relevant to our keyword. At the end of the day, we want to choose multiple keywords to try and rank on Google for that page. So for example, we have a blog and we're using ice cream recipes and we're blogging about ice cream recipes, we can have a primary keyword that is about ice cream recipes or homemade ice cream recipes. We're going to always want to find out what the volume and the competition is. Our secondary keyword could be built around other similar keywords like low fat ice cream recipes or fat free ice cream recipes or low fat homemade ice cream recipes. Those are complementary keywords, just like our bread recipes and banana bread recipe. So one thing we want to do when we do keyword research is we want to be able to target one keyword per content when you can target many. We want to be able to target multiple keywords, not necessarily target one keyword. And so we want to be able to cluster keywords. So we don't want to target just one, we want to target multiple keywords per page. And when we talk about clustering, if we go back to our keyword research, what we're doing is we're clustering a bunch of keywords under the theme bread recipes. And so by looking at the volume, looking at the competition, looking at the KEI, we can choose different keywords for our page. And that's what we mean by clustering. We want to cluster keywords into a content theme. So why target only one keyword per content when we can target many? Because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. We don't want to target just one keyword. We want to target many. And so that means clustering your keywords into a theme and choosing multiple keywords for that particular page. And when we do that, we have a better opportunity to rank high on Google search and the whole idea behind ranking high on Google search is we can get the volume. So if we know we're ranked number one on Google search for bread recipes or banana bread recipe, we know we stand a chance of getting a majority of the volume associated with that keyword. And if we can get the volume and get the traffic, then we can get the conversions. So let's move on to high quality content and talk about the impact content has on your ability to get your website ranked number one on Google. So let's just say you have content on your website and the content is ranking on you know, page four of Google and it's that blog with ice cream recipes. And if it's just content for the sake of content, it's not really informative, then it's not necessarily going to get good engagement. In the eyes of Google, you know, they want to rank content that's very informative, it's very fresh, it's exciting to read, it's interesting, it's going to have good engagement. So if it's a recipe or an article about any topic, if it's the content is just not informative, then you're not going to get good engagement. And when you don't get good engagement, if people don't stay on the site, to engage in the content and they just leave the website after landing on the page causing a bounce then the content is just going to continue to fall down the rankings and we want to prevent that we want to move up the rankings we want to be number one on google we don't necessarily want to fall in the rankings for our content so content is a key driver in being able to rank number one on google so if the content is on page nine what can we do well, we want to be able to, you know, take that content and do something with it. We feel like we did write engaging content, so let's go ahead and share it on social media. And to me, social media is a good platform to share your content because on social media platforms like Facebook, for example, you're building a community on that platform. That community is already interested in your content. So if you're sharing an ice cream recipe, especially in the summertime, and you're engaging with your community on that platform, 
then the likelihood of that community on that platform is going to increase engagement. Increased engagement will send social signals to the search engine that says, hey, this content is good quality. Likewise, for any other platform, most social media platforms have engagement metrics and those engagement metrics pass signals. Is it good? Is it not good? Do we like this content? Are we giving it a thumbs up? Are we going to want to follow it? Are we going to want to share it? And so if you share content that you feel is engaging on social platforms, then it's going to be engaging and it's likely going to cause an increase in engagement, for example, a decrease in bounces. Mm -hmm. And once you share that quality content, then the likelihood of it moving up the rankings, even as far as number one on Google, is going to be greater. So you always want to start out writing good quality content. So let's talk about good quality content because Google does take content seriously. They do take into account what other people think of that content. So high quality content is an important factor. So how to create good content? That's always the question. So let's talk about some best practices here. Remember, in the last segment, we talked about keyword research. So we want to perform good keyword research. Why? Because we want to choose keywords. Remember, we're choosing multiple keywords per page. One keyword could be related to our brand. One keyword could be related to the content, but another keyword could be related to a user's intent, like recipes. If you recall the example we use with bread recipes, maybe somebody's looking to type in a keyword that says, how do I make, you know, a bread? Or how do I make a specific type of bread? Or how do I make banana bread? Or what's the best recipe for banana bread? They're question related. And we want to be able to answer those questions. So that's where choosing those right keywords that's going to respond to a user's intent. So starts with choosing the right keywords. So Remember, we talked about a number of different tools when we talked about keyword research. So there's a research tool that you can use called phrase.io and that will help you do quick research on, you know, keywords and trends and whatnot. So if you know a better research tool that you use for keyword research, then drop us a comment below. I'd be interested in getting your comments about keyword research and what research tools are out there. So if you know something better than phrase.io, drop a comment below and we'd be interested in getting your perspective. So keyword research is key, but creating content that fulfills users' requirements. So answering those questions. If it's a recipe, we want to answer that question. If it's directions, we want to answer that question. If they don't know how to do something, we want to answer that question. And that's the whole idea behind content. Content is not just to fill a page. It's to really fulfill users' requirements. That's when you get good engagement. So if somebody's typing in something on Google and they're looking for an answer, your content should answer that question. But we also want to make the content readable. So in other words, you know, write for your audience. Don't impress anybody with very high vocabulary type words that somebody doesn't necessarily know the meaning of. Don't use jargon. Don't use a street language, for example. Use everyday common language that's just easily digestible when your audience is reading. And then we want to keep that content organized. And so when we mean organized, we want to use headers and subheaders you know, break your content into paragraphs, keep the flow organized. If we can keep the flow organized, then it's going to be easier for somebody to read. And then it's okay to add resources, especially resources from credible sites. So if you can incorporate those resources in there, then it's just going to add the credibility to your content. Let the audience know that, hey, I've done my research on this topic, and this is what this person has to say about it. This person who seems to be credible. Okay, so it only adds value to your content. So these are all tips to remember when creating content. And then the one important tip here is we want to use white hat techniques. And when we say white hat techniques, that means, you know, if we've chosen keywords that are going to answer somebody's question, we don't want to stuff those keywords into the content. We want the content to be naturally written. So when we say opt for white hat uh, techniques, that's what we mean. Write the content naturally. Keep it organized, keep it readable, 
include third-party sources, and make sure it answers a question. So there are different types of content. So there's content where you just write words. It's all text-based. You could also use an infographic. An infographic is simply just a graphic that visualizes exactly what you're trying to explain. For example, if we want to write an article about how to write good engaging content, we don't necessarily have to write all that out as a text. We can create an infographic. So for example, here's an infographic on 20 effective ways to basically not bore your readers, but write engaging content. So you could see this is an infographic. It's all graphically laid out. So infographics tend to be easier to understand because they're visual. They're easy for the end user to comprehend because there's generally no jargon. It's usually images that are portraying the point of what you're trying to get across. And so it tends to break it up, the monotony of just text. It's more visually appealing and it's laid out and organized. So you can see this infographic has 20 different steps or rules and they lay those out all here in this infographic. And the great thing I like about infographics is you could, you could share them on social media. You can re-engage them as a post. You could save them on really any social platform. So infographics tend to tell a better story versus say just writing text. You can use video and images. So you don't necessarily have to lay it all out in an infographic. You can certainly insert a video or an image into your content, especially if it's a blog post. If it's a blog post, then sometimes video and images on its own tell the story. You don't necessarily need text to go ahead and tell your story, a video, or an image, as they say, tells a thousand words. And so images and videos are great to use in a blog post. So using different forms of content, you know, you always want to review your content. When a user dwells on your web page for a longer time, Google will tend to think, okay, this person's engaged, so we're going to rank that favorably. So if you're using infographics, videos, and images, then the chances of somebody being more engaged are going to increase versus just text that's not well organized and written out in a way that somebody doesn't necessarily understand. So be creative in the types of content you use. So longer engaging content tends to bode well with search engines. So this is according to HubSpot. So the more word count you use, the more words you use, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. Just take into account best practices. You wanna maybe break up the content with an image, organize it, make it engaging, use headers. So it's not necessarily just words, it's the words and how those words are written, how they're structured, the types of keywords you're using, how you're engaging with your audience. There's a lot of factors, again, those best practices we just went over. But the key is, you know, if you have longer, more engaging content, then it's going to bode better for you on search engines. So a couple of steps to create high quality content. So you want to begin with a comprehensive introduction. So always introduce your content. Remember the content should be relevant to the keywords. So if you're choosing keywords in your keyword research, think about answering that question. If somebody's typing in bread recipes, maybe they're looking for banana bread recipes. How to make the best banana bread or how to make banana bread using dried figs. We want to be able to align our content with that keyword naturally. You want to create a title that's worthy, that's click worthy. So remember, if you're in Google search and you're doing search for something simple like bread recipes, we want to make something that's going to be you know, engaging for somebody to click on, like easy, perfect yeast bread or easy, crusty French bread or something that's going to be engaging. You know, the best bread recipes or how to make the best homemade bread. You know, something that's going to draw somebody's attention to the title of that blog post. So we want to include LSI keywords. So what I mean by LSI keywords in your content, we mean, you know, long tail keywords, make it natural. Headings and subheadings should consist of keywords and variants. So if you're writing headers and subheaders, include the keyword in there. And that way the, the content always stays relevant to the audience. 
Okay, shorten your sentences and paragraphs, so don't write long paragraphs. Remember, we wanna break this up. We wanna make it easy for the end user to read. And we want to always put internal links on our blog post. Why? Because if we have internal links, then if we have a link from one blog post to another blog post, or say our blog post to an internal page on our website, we want to make sure that it's relevant content. That way, if somebody is reading something and you have an internal link, let's just say from a bread recipes page to a banana bread recipes page, then they may find it interesting, click on that link and go to the banana bread recipes page. So it's keeping somebody engaged on your website. So putting in internal linking will help keep the, the end user engaged because you're offering up links that's relevant to the content. You always want to break up that content with images. Okay, we want to use alt tags, meaning we want to pen the image with text. So that way, if the image doesn't load, then at least the alt text will load. So we can incorporate call out boxes. And more importantly, we want to update our content regularly. So we always want to get the best recipe out there if it's banana bread or different ways to create banana bread or always just coming up with ways to update the content. So we want to keep our content, our blog post fresh. And then we want to include a CTA, a call to action. If we include a call to action, then that's going to keep somebody engaged and have them act on your content. So these are steps to creating high quality content. And so let's look at an example here. And this is a three month old post on Buzzfeed. And it, it's 21 pictures that restore your faith in humanity. So it has a lot of likes, a lot of tweaks, and that means it's engaged. People are engaged when reading that. And so if we go and look at it as an example, we could see it on Buzzfeed here, 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity. So this was written back in 2012. Again, a lot of engagement. But if we look at it, we can see immediately that it's taking into account third party sources. It's got some content, it's got images, it's being broken up by images. We could see there's call to actions on there in the form of social so people can go ahead and go ahead and share it if they like it, okay? It includes videos, it includes images, third party sources. So it's a good post because listen, you know, it's engaging content. It's probably answering somebody's question about humanity. And we could see clearly that look, you know, there's a lot of different examples here from a lot of different sources and we could take action on this content. So not just video, not just images, but text as well. And so it's very engaging, answers questions, takes into account the different types of content available. So this is a good post in that regard. So content's updated regularly, it's engaging, and it includes sources from high authority websites. Some do's and don'ts on the content. So take into account the best practices I mentioned about creating high quality content. Okay. Answer those questions that the end user wants to hear, you know, because that likely is going to be their search. And so you want to be able to respond to the end user. That's part of creating high quality content. Different types of content, i.e. in the form of infographics or videos or text or images. You can add images from public domain sites. You can be relatable and use examples to clarify points, just like the BuzzFeed article. Simplify complex words. Don't use sophisticated language. Talk to your audience as if you they were standing right in front of you. And use bullet points to exemplify your examples, your points. So some do's, the don'ts. Obviously, don't lift content. We don't want to lift content from another website. So that's plagiarism. So we want to have our own unique content. We also don't want to take images from other websites. And so if you do happen to find an image that works for your post and it's on somebody else's website, ideally that's not a good situation. But if you do happen to do that, then always give credit to the website. Okay, so if you took it from xyz.com, credit xyz.com for the image and even put a link back. But ideally, you don't want to take images from other websites. Just as much as you don't want to take copy, you don't want to take images. Use your own imagery and content. But if you don't have imagery, then you can always 
go to stock photography. There are plenty of websites out there where you can sign up for a subscription like uh, Adobe Stock Images as an example. You could sign up for an account and in some cases you can sign up for a free account and use stock imagery. Okay, don't give less information to your audience. Give your audience what they deserve, which is the information they're looking for. They're looking for the best banana bread recipes. Give them the best banana bread recipes. Incorporate your own images. Break it up with titles. Give them a good quality piece of content that they're going to be able to engage with. And so if you put long paragraphs in your content, then it's going to be less engaging. So try to avoid those long paragraphs. Remember, shorten up the paragraphs, keep the language simple, add in images, answer those questions, use third party credible sources, but write it in your own words and you should be on your way to creating good quality content. Okay, so now that we've talked about high quality content in order to get your pages ranked high on Google search, let's turn our attention to optimizing on page elements and discuss some website level factors that are both going to help you rank high on Google search. So let's just do an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about on page elements and website level factors. So optimizing on page elements include a number of different things. But primarily, we're going to focus in on meta tags, also known as meta description tags, header tags, also known as title tags, and URLs. So those are just some of the on-page elements we want to be able to optimize using relevant keywords in order to rank high in Google search. We also want to take a look at some website factors that will affect our ranking on Google search. They include website architecture having a secure website, having a sitemap, and taking a look at page speed. So all of those are some of the website factors we need to take into account in order to rank high on Google search. So title tag and meta description together are considered meta tags. So both play an important role in ranking high on Google. So we want to be able to write unique title and descriptions for each page on our website. When I say unique, that means the title and the meta description need to be different for every page on the website. And so if you're not quite sure what a title tag and a meta description tag is, if you go to search and just type in any particular search query, the title tag is what's going to show up here in bold. And then the description is going to show up below it, below the URL, and that's going to describe the page. So both of these meta tags are important because it describes what your page is all about, and that's what Google uses in the search results pages. So we want to be able to pay attention to the length of our meta tags. So if we go back to our search results pages, met title tags are generally 60, 65 characters. Meta description tags are generally 160 characters. So anything really longer than that, then what's going to happen is the meta description tag or the title tag will get truncated. And so if we look here, for example, we can see all of the title tags here fit the 65 character limit. But if you run over the character count on meta description, then Google is going to truncate the copy. So you want to stay within your parameters in order to avoid getting your content truncated. And so the other thing when we're writing title meta description tags, we want to minimize keyword repetition. So if we're optimizing for keyword, we don't want to necessarily just plug that keyword into the title tag and meta description multiple times. We want to make sure our title tags and meta descriptions are naturally written. So if somebody's typing for banana bread recipe with dried figs, you know, we want to have a nice title tag and a description that is going to get somebody to respond uh, based on their need. And so we definitely want to avoid keyword repetition, but we want to be able to use that keyword in the title tag. Because if you remember from the earlier segment, when we did the all in title syntax to find out exactly how many competitors were using that particular keyword, well, we obviously want to use that keyword in the title tag because again, the title tag is an important factor when it comes to search engine results. So we want to use the keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing or using it 
repetitively in our title tag and our meta description. We want the title tag and the meta description to describe the page, sound natural, but also be engaging because the point is we want people to click on our link and go to our website from search engines. So title tags with numbers tend to result in higher click-through rates. This is according to Moz. So for example, if you just put in a title tag that says learn digital marketing, well, that may work, but if you put a number in there, like five easy ways to learn digital marketing, that might get somebody to click on your link and go to your website. So having questions in your meta tags can also increase your click-through rate. For example, if you just put learn the importance of first page rankings, not too bad, but again, generic. But if you put it into the formal question, how to rank number one on Google, it's more action oriented. It's gonna get somebody to resonate with the question that they have. And that may be their query, how to rank number one on Google. And so these techniques will help you get higher click-through rates. And so according to Backlinko, title tag with a keyword can improve site ranking. So remember, we wanna include that keyword in the title tag, even though we only have 65 characters, we wanna include that keyword, but we wanna avoid stuffing the keyword in there. We wanna, again, make the title tag action-oriented, maybe with a number, maybe as a question, with the keyword in there once, naturally. Not easy to do, but that's the beauty of SEO. If you can follow these best practices and write a good title tag, then the chances of you improving in your search results are gonna be greater. So having only one H1 tag in your post is going to be good. So remember, when somebody clicks on a link, so let's just say they do find a title tag engaging, and they click on this, this link here, and they go to that website, you know, you want to start out with having that particular H1 tag. Because the H1 tag, especially with the keyword in it, is going to signal to Google, hey, we're organizing our page, and because it's an H1 tag, it's important. We're structuring the page according to best practices. So having only one H1 tag in your post is definitely helpful. Having multiple tags, H tags in your post, help organize the page a lot better. So we wanna add that targeted keyword in that tag, and your header tags should be relevant to the content. So if we go back to our example of the using dried figs with banana breads, well, the title says California Fig Banana Bread. And remember the last segment when we we're talking about high quality content? Well, look no further than including a video into our content. So not only will this video help keep the engagement high, but it breaks up the monotony of the page. And it's from a third party source, so it adds credibility to the page. So adding a video based on the last segment of high quality content definitely helps with ranking high on Google search. So following high article structure, that means putting those H tags in there. H2 tags help break up the content. And we wanna avoid repetition of H1 tags on your different web pages of your site, meaning don't just put the same H1 tag with the same keyword in it and keeping it blase. We wanna make those H1 tags exciting to read, but also used appropriately to break up the content. So remember, all white hat techniques. We wanna avoid hidden tags. We wanna avoid stuffing keywords. We want things to be natural. We don't want things to be forced. And your H1 tag should be 20 to 70 characters. Don't make long H1 tags. So if we go back to our page example, a short, sweet tag here, California fig banana bread. It's relevant to the content. It's short, sweet, and breaks up the monotony of the content. And more importantly, again, any content you have on the page should always answer the user's intent. Remember, people are using search to answer questions, find information. Our content should be able to answer that for them. So according to John Muller, Senior Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google, header tags would definitely help Google for rankings and the search results. So we want to use header tags. So when it comes to URLs, we wanna use hyphens and avoid underscores. 
So if we look at this URL here, this uses hyphens, fig and banana bread. So it's all broken up with hyphens. That's a best practice. Remember, canonical URLs. A canonical URL signals to Google this is the original content. So we want to use original content. And if you have multiple sources of content out there on, say, different websites, we want to use a canonical tag to signal to Google, this is the original content, please index this content. And that doesn't hurt to use a favicon in URL, meaning a small icon, it helps to break up the monotony and help your URL stand out. We can add targeted keywords in the URL. So again, looking at the URL here, I could see we're using targeted keyword as part of the URL structure. Fig and banana bread. And notice the H1 tag is fig banana bread. So it's all consistent and it flows naturally. URLs that are no longer existing, then we want to be able to set up a redirect for those URLs, meaning a 301 redirect is a server response for Google that says, hey, Google, this page is no longer available, but it, we permanently redirected it to this page, which is now available. So that's what a 301 redirect does. It helps signal to Google and all the other search engines that if the page is no longer there, that's fine. You're just gonna go to this page. This is the page that's permanently there now. And another thing we wanna do here is if you have mobile URLs, you wanna include those in the sitemap. And we're gonna hit on that in just a minute. But all URLs should be mobile friendly as well as desktop friendly. Meaning take into account those best practices. Keep your URLs short, use hyphens, put the keyword in that URL, and make it easy to understand. Wanna avoid capital letters in the URLs? The URLs are case sensitive, so go lowercase. You should always go lowercase on the URL. Readable URLs, again, the rule of thumb here is if you understand what the URL is, then Google's gonna understand what the URL is. So the shorter the URL, the easier it is to read, the easier it is to read, the better chance you have to rank high on Google search. So according to Backlink2, URLs that are shorter definitely, definitely help you rank. So we want to be able to shorten those URLs. Keep them short and sweet. Don't make them long and unreadable. So those are some on optimized ways or on page elements that help you optimize. Now we want to look at some website level factors that will help you optimize and rank high on Google search. So good site structure provides better crawling for search engine bots. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean having your site organized in a fashion that Google's going to be able to find all the pages. So what do we mean by that? Create a logical hierarchy structure. So if you're selling shoes, you know, you're going to have a home page, break the structure up into men's shoes, women's shoes, children's shoes. Then under men's shoes, you could have it by brand. It could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the women's side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the child side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to keep the structure flow in a hierarchy. So we want to balance the amount of subcategories within each category. So the men's, if it has Nike, Puma, Adidas, the women should have Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to code your site navigation in CSS or HTML, meaning we want to be able to use something that Google is going to be able to index. So most sites are built in HTML, and that's what Google likes to index. They like to index something that they could take back to their servers. And then more importantly, build a comprehensive structure for internal linking. So internal links mean that if you're on a site, you should have natural links pointing to other pages on your website. So to keep the flow going. And we don't want to have unnatural inbound links. You always want to have natural internal links to keep the flow of the user going from one page to the other. So here I can see, as an example, all the ingredients in this recipe. Well, this has an internal link to another page on our site. And this happens to link to a page where somebody can buy the ingredient. So it's a natural internal link. So 
John Doherty of Credo has claimed that one of the biggest changes that he can make in fixing the Credo website is architecture. So for example, in Credo, John Doherty has increased the organic sessions by 74% and pages by per session by 41% just by changing the site architecture. So you'd be surprised by changing the site architecture what that will do to engagement. And so let's our, turn our attention to secure versus non-secure. So what we mean by that is securing your site, we wanna make it sure that compliant with certain protocols. And so if we go back here, we can see that this particular site is compliant, it is secure. HTTPS means it has a secure license, meaning the site is secure. So Google likes secure versus non-secure. So non-secure would be HTTP. So we want HTTPS as our protocol. And what that means is just enabling SSL certificates. And that means when you enable an SSL certificate, that means your domain or your protocol is gonna be turned to HTTPS. So Google prefers sites that are secure versus non-secure. So if you use HSTS as a protocol, that adds an extra layer of security over the HTTPS. And HSTS prevents cookie hijacking. So adding multiple layers of security always helps. In my opinion, if you have an HTTP website, a non-secure website, you should look into buying an SSL certificate, getting your sites flipped over to HTTPS, because what's gonna happen is your URL structure is gonna change. When your URL structure changes, Google's gonna recognize that because they're gonna index your site. And when they index your site, they're gonna see those secure URLs, and that's gonna work favorably in your favor and help you rank higher on Google search. So websites using secure or HTTPS have a higher chance of ranking higher. So HTTPS is a ranking signal because Google indexes those pages. So let's also talk about sitemaps. So sitemap is one of the most important ways to improve your website ranking. Why? Well, because sitemaps are a way to organize all your URLs into one file. So we're basically going to uh, prioritize all our web pages in a sitemap. So if you go to any particular website and you type in sitemap XML, you're likely going to see all the pages on your website. So usually the sitemap is located in the root directory. So if I type in sitemap.xml, I'm gonna be able to see all the pages in my root directory. And I can also prioritize them. I can also alert Google as to how often they change. And every page is going to have a date stamp associated with it. So Google can actually see how often it changes. So remember, we want our content to be updated frequently. So if content's not updated frequently or it's not fresh, then Google's gonna see that site, that, that date stamp, that last modification date. So we wanna be able to make sure our content's updated frequently. We wanna let Google know that we changed it frequently. And we wanna be able to prioritize our pages, let Google know, hey, these pages are important to us. So all that can be set up in a sitemap. We wanna be able to add canonical versions of URLs in the sitemap. So we wanna be able to add all our original URLs in our sitemap. And so we always wanna build dynamic URL sitemaps for larger websites. And what I mean by dynamic URLs, that means that if I look at this sitemap and we're always adding content, let's just say in the form of a blog, well, guess what? We want those pages to be added to the sitemap as they're published. So as we add pages to the blog or to the site, then they should automatically be added to the sitemap. And so in effect, what's gonna happen is we're gonna be able to see the sitemap grow with more URLs. When the sitemap grows with more URLs, then that means then Google's gonna index more pages. They're gonna index more fresh pages. So they're gonna be able to get those pages that are just published quicker. So that's the whole idea behind dynamic sitemaps is we wanna be able to capture all the URLs just as they're published. And we wanna be able to maintain our sitemaps. And so I would always recommend a dynamic sitemap, but you can always create your own sitemap just by going to a tool called XML sitemap. So if I just type in XML sitemaps into Google search, here I could see XML sitemaps generator, and I can be able, if I have a small website, just create a free and simple 
sitemap on my own. When XML sitemaps creates it, or your platform creates a dynamic sitemap, either way, the sitemap's going to sit in the root directory. And then what we wanna do in turn is let Google know where that sitemap is. So in Search Console, we wanna be able to submit the sitemap. So you're gonna add the sitemap, you're gonna let Google know where it is. It should be in the root directory, and it should be called sitemap.xml. And when you do that, Google's gonna be able to take those URLs and index them. So we could see we submitted 528 URLs, Google indexed 521. So one thing about URLs here is when we create a sitemap, we're putting all our URLs in there. We do not add no index URLs in your sitemap. And what that means is that any URL we don't want Google to index, we're just going to exclude from the sitemap, okay? So we want Google to take all the URLs we want indexed and put them in the sitemap. So according to Edgy, using sitemaps for SEO can increase your website's visibility and help you get indexed. Why? Because what you're in effect doing is taking all your URLs that you want indexed, you're telling Google how often they're modified, you're telling Google which ones are important, and you're submitting that to Google. And so Google's gonna be able to take all these URLs quicker, index them quicker, and when they're indexed quicker, you can get ranked quicker. And when you get ranked quicker, you can get traffic quicker. So that's the whole idea behind sitemaps. So let's turn our attention to page speed now. So one of the last factors for our website, besides architecture, making it secure, and adding sitemaps, is we wanna take a look at how quick our pages load. Here are some tips in order to optimize page speed because ideally the quicker a page loads, the more engaged the user is going to be. If it takes a longer time for the page to load all the elements of that page, then what's going to happen is the user is going to get impatient, maybe leave the website altogether or go to another page. And so we want to be able to optimize images. So any image that's of large size in terms of megabytes, we want to be able to optimize that can compress the image. So that's one way to speed up page speed. We want to use a simple website design, you know, HTML with CSS or cascading style sheets. Just a simple design with simple a hierarchy and website navigation structure. So nothing fancy, nothing complex, just a simple website design with optimized images. We wanna leverage browser caching and we wanna upgrade the server response time, meaning all your files are sitting on the server. So when somebody goes to a web page, the server is serving up all of those files, the images, the text, etc. And so we want the server to respond as quick as possible. So when it comes to page speed, we can look at the factors affecting page speed in Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics and I go under behavior and I go under site speed and I go to overview, I'm going to be able to see what my average load time is for my site. And ideally, we want our pages to load as quick as possible. So that means anything under four seconds, anything four seconds or higher, and it's likely the end user is going to leave the page. There's a correlation be between page load time and bounce rate. And so what Google actually does is give you speed suggestions. So if we do have a page that loads slow, we can just go to speed suggestions in Google Analytics. And we go to speed suggestions, then Google's gonna be able to tell us, hey, this particular page load fast, this particular page loads slow, and if it loaded slow, why is it loading slow? So here we could see the home page as an example is loading on average of seven seconds. Well, if we look here, they're gonna give us some suggestions. So if I click on this page speed suggestions, it's going to load a report and a tool called PageSpeed Insights. And basically what it's then going to do after it's done running is it's going to tell me all the ways in which I can optimize my pages, not only for desktop, but also for mobile. So here I could see for desktop or for mobile, I can look at some ways in which I can optimize it to increase page speed. 
For example, sizing my images properly, server response time, reducing my server response time, avoiding multiple page redirects. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can do to speed up page load time. And all that's found in PageSpeed Insights and all that's found within Google Analytics. So remember, optimizing code, minimizing redirects, optimizing your images, upgrading your server response time, all of those are factors. And so, Again, you can go into analytics, page speed insights, and you can see exactly what Google is recognizing as what's lowering or slowing down your page load time. So Google takes site speed as one of the most important ranking factors. Why? Because they're going to rank pages, not only with high quality content that are relevant to the keyword queries, but they want those pages to have a good user experience. So if somebody clicks on the page, then the user should be able to see that content fairly quickly. And so that's why it's such an important factor. So the quicker your pages load, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. So according to Web Performance Today, Walmart, as an example, experienced a decline in conversions. So what they did was looked at their page speed. And when they looked at their page speed, you'd be surprised what that did just increasing it from one to four seconds or decreasing it basically increase conversion. So there's always going to be a correlation between how quick a page loads and how engaged the user is. Because if it's users engaged, they're going to stay on the site. And if they stay on the site, then their chances of converting are going to be higher. So just even one to two seconds increase in page load, load time will make a world of difference in terms of engagement and conversions. Let's turn our attention to off-site engagement. So previously we talked about on-page elements and website factors that affect our rankings for search results, but we also need to turn our attention away from our website, meaning what we do on our website, and turn our attention what we can do for our website off our website and onto other websites. So that's off-site engagement. And so let's look at an example. So that ice cream recipes blog. So we did everything we possibly could. We updated the meta tags, the title tag, the meta description. We added H1 tags. We've made sure the site architecture was sound. We submitted a site map. We, we made sure the page load was good and fast. So we did all the things we we're supposed to do on our web page, but we're still not ranking. Well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to turn our attention away from our website into other websites. We call this off-site or off-page SEO. And we need to basically generate links from high-quality sites back to our site. So if we've done everything we can on our own website and we're still not ranking where we want to be, well, then we need to turn our attention to other websites. And so if we turn our attention to other websites and other websites that are relevant, other websites that are of quality, other websites that have high domain authority, then we're going to see an increase in rankings. So it's just a matter of getting quality links from quality websites that are relevant. That's what's going to move the needle on search after we've taken care of all the on-page elements. So more backlinks from high domain authority results in higher rankings. SEO is a combination between what we do on our website, meaning optimizing the page and making sure our website has good site architecture and follows the best practices in terms of site maps and page load. Then we need to turn our attention to the backlinking to improve our domain authority. So according to Backlinko, analysis off-site engagement is one of the most important elements for ranking number one in google so you, you can't just focus your attention on updating the title tag and making sure the pages load fast you have to turn your attention as well to getting back links from high quality sites that's off-site engagement and so gaining links back links from multiple domains is vital it's vital because they bring referring traffic to your site they bring credibility to your site. But more importantly, Google's gonna recognize the relationship between these sites and your website. And if these sites that have backlinks or links pointing to your site, and if they're of high quality, then we call that passing link juice. So it's going to bring quality to you in terms of organic search. So if we look at an example, if I do a search for banana bread recipe, 
There are 241 billion results for banana bread recipe. Why did this particular page from Simply Recipes rank number one? Well, we can turn our attention to Moz, and Moz has a report called Link Explorer. And so Moz Link Explorer report helps us identify our own page authority, our own domain authority, and how many links we have from other quality websites. So if I put that particular URL into Link Explorer, and notice the URL here is short, even though it uses an underscore when it should use a hyphen, it's still ranked number one. And why? Because off page elements help this page rank number one. Why? Their page authority out of 100 is 58. Their domain authority out of 100 is 82. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they have a lot of good links from other domains of high quality. They have 824 linking domains to this one domain. They have 3,600 inbound links. And they're ranking for a lot of different keywords. So if we scroll down, we're going to be able to see kind of a breakout the quality of websites that are linking to them. So they have 19 domains with a domain authority of 91 to 100 linking to them. They have 15 domains between the range of 81 and 90. So what does that tell me between 15 and 19? That's 34 particular domains that are very high quality linking to them. And so we could see the breakout of the linking domains. We could see the top file links to the site and we could see the page authority. So the Link Explorer report gives us an overview of what pages are linking to ours. And it also gives us an idea of what our own page authority and domain authority are. Because domain authority and page authority both need to be high in order for us to rank on Google search. And in order for it to get high, we need links from high quality sites. So that's the whole idea behind off-site engagement. So some of the offsite engagements are influencer marketing, meaning is there somebody out there on social who has a huge following? But not only do they have a huge following, but are they relevant to our product? For example, Usain Bolt, who's a famous sprinter. If we're selling shoes and we're selling Nike shoes, maybe Usain Bolt can reference us on Twitter or Facebook. That's influencer marketing, getting people to influencing people to buy our product. We can engage with audiences on multiple social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Meaning if we're running a promotion on those running shoes, then we can promote that on Facebook. Okay. We can promote that on Twitter. We can also bookmark our webpage on popular bookmarking sites like StumbleUpon. We can also put our content on discussion forums like Reddit. We can join high PR quality Q&A sites, excuse me, and post answers to questions related to our business like Quora.com. So we can engage in sharing our content and answering questions. So there's lots of ways to get links to your website. If you have a blog post as an example, you can make sure that maybe that content is shared on a similar blog post. So if you have an ice cream recipe blog post, well, maybe you can look at a dessert blog post and share your content on that particular blog post and have a backlink pointing from that blog post to yours as an example. And you can reciprocate. So the whole idea of content is sharing the content, but at the same time of sharing it, you're producing backlinks and backlinks help domain authority. So not only do they help domain authority, but they improve the search rankings. So in Google's eyes, the higher your domain authority, higher the page authority. In Google's eyes, that means your page is important, it's credible, and we're going to improve it in the search engine rankings. It increases brand visibility. If we have our content on a highly engageable website, a highly popular website or a blog, it's, not, it's going to lift our brand visibility. If we have Usain Bolt, who's a very famous sprinter, do some influence in marketing for us, then that's going to increase our brand visibility. So anytime we can associate with something that has some influence or some clout or high domain authority, then it's only going to increase our brand awareness and visibility. So again, it's going to increase our domain authority because of the association of passing link juice from one domain to another. It's going to then, as a result, increase referral traffic 
Because if we're on a high quality website that gets a lot of traffic, then the chances of some of that traffic going to our site is going to be great. And again, it improves the credibility and trust of our website. And that's what we want. We want Google to trust us. And a way to build trust is by associating our website with other websites of high, equal or higher quality. So when we talk about offsite engagement, we want to do some guest posts on relevant websites. So if you have that ice cream blog, go to another blog like the, the dessert blog and do a guest post. So not only that will that improve your brand awareness, but it'll generate a backlink and maybe drive some referral traffic. You can participate in forums and blog discussions like core.com or Reddit. Get your content out there. Start a discussion about a specific topic to engage users, build brand awareness and generate that backlink. You can always, you know, put your, your site on a directory like Yelp, for example, or Yahoo directory. You could prefer testimonial link building, meaning if you serve products or offer up a service, well, somebody could provide a testimony on their website. Or you could just earn backlinks from relevant authoritative web pages like we mentioned Quora or Wikipedia. Or, there's plenty out there. So the idea is to associate yourself with high quality websites, but do it naturally. You don't want to force anything. So if, if you're selling a specific service or you're selling a specific product, Look for like mining services or products that complement what you do. And that'll create the natural environment, natural ecosystem that will eventually give you the benefits that you need to rank higher in the search results pages. So we don't want to purchase any links. We don't want to cloak content. We don't want to just inject links on sites that aren't relevant. We don't want to just have site wide links all over the place pointing to the same page. And we certainly don't want to be on low quality websites or directories. It's all about quality, not quantity with offsite engagement. So having offsite engagement complements what you do on your website for on site. Together, both of those efforts will get you higher search engine results. Let's go over some key takeaways for today's session. We started out with the keyword research. Remember with the keyword research, it's all about relevancy combined with volume and low competition. So that combination is going to get you the keywords you need for on page optimization. So use good tools at your disposal, like Google's keyword planner. Google's keyword planner is going to give you the volume you need. Use the, the all in title syntax on Google to get an idea of competition. Cluster your keywords together in themes like bread recipes. Look for a bunch of keywords related to bread recipes if that's what you're trying to optimize for. Pick the keywords that are going to generate high quality content. So when you pick good keywords that generate high quality content, then focus on that high quality content. You want to start with a good title. You want to choose keywords that are going to complement the content that you can work into the content naturally. You can, you know, organize the content by using headers. You can write your content so it's going to be easy to understand. Write shorter paragraphs. Incorporate images, call outs, videos. You know, mix it up a bit. Add CTAs in there. Make it engaging. Answer the user's questions. All of these are going to contribute to good quality content. The whole idea beyond good quality content is to make sure your users are engaged because the more engaged in the content, the better chance you have to rank on Google. So when you create content, that gives you the opportunity to optimize that content. And by optimizing, we mean working those keywords naturally into the meta tags, the title tag and the meta description. You know, work those keywords into the header. You know, make sure the header is short, sweet, concise, but powerful and it makes sense. It's relevant to the content. You know, make sure the URL is short, but readable. And then we talked about off page. So off page elements for the website, meaning submit the site map, look in Google analytics at page load time, make sure your site's secure. And once you do all those things to your website, all those factors, then you could turn your entire attention to link building off site engagement. We talked about influencer marketing or, or social platforms or other websites that are going to not only provide a link, but they're going to give you credibility, brand awareness. They're going to refer 
traffic to your website and then they're going to overall improve your domain and page authority so all those factors combined are going to help you improve your search engine rankings thank you rob for that interesting session i hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the simply learn channel for more such videos Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.